a live broadcast. Uh, you should be all set, Commissioner Eggers. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to have everybody here tuning in again. Um, nice, uh, nice turnout uh, this afternoon. Um, before we get started, I did have a formal piece that I have to read uh, for virtual meetings. So if you'll just uh, bear with me. Um, and, and just again, good afternoon and welcome to the September 9th virtual, uh, virtual forward Pinellas meeting, which is convening pursuant to Executive Order 2069 issued by the Office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20, 2020, and extended by Executive Orders 2112, 2114, 2150, and 2193. Uh, allowing local government bodies to conduct meetings of their governing boards without having a quorum of its members present physically or at any specific location and utilizing communications media technology such as telephonic or video conferencing as provided by section 12054 paragraph 5b2 florida uh, florida statutes procedures for public comment will be explain, explained by the process coordinator shortly and at this time, the members of the four uh, Pinellas board appearing remotely for this meeting will be stated by the technology moderator. Whew, Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm gonna ask each board member individually to confirm that you are here, able to hear us and can respond. Please note that everyone but myself and the chair is currently on mute. You should be able to unmute yourself, but if you're having trouble, I can also unmute you. The board members appearing virtually today are Chair, Commissioner Dave Eggers, Pinellas County. Uh, good afternoon, I'm here. Thank you. Vice Chair, Council Member Darden Rice, City of St. Petersburg. Hello, Darden Rice here. Thank you. Treasurer, Mayor Cookie Kennedy, City of Indian Rocks Beach, representing the beach communities. Hi everyone, good to be here. Thank you. Secretary, Commissioner Janet Long, Pinellas County, representing PSTA. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Mayor Julie Bajalski, City of Dunedin. Hey, Sarah. Thank you. Commissioner Connor Donovan, City of Tarpon Springs, representing the cities of Tarpon Springs, Oldsmar, and Safety Harbor. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Susie Sofer, City of Bel Air Bluffs, representing the inland communities. Hi. Thank you. Commissioner Michael Smith, City of Largo. Here. Thank you. Vice Mayor David Albritton, City of Clearwater. Good afternoon, everybody. Present. Thank you. Mayor Sandra Bradbury, City of Pinellas Park. Good afternoon and present. Thank Good you. to see everybody. <laughs> Commissioner Karen Seal, Pinellas County. Good afternoon. Thank you. Commissioner Ken Welch, Pinellas County. Good afternoon, Sarah. Thank you, good afternoon. The board members are here and accounted for. Please note that everyone except for the chair and process coordinator is now going to be placed on mute. Tina, will you please state the procedures to be followed during this meeting? Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see you all. I'll take the next few minutes to review the process that has been devised for this meeting. There will be a technology moderator and a process coordinator for this virtual meeting who will be tasked with facilitating the meeting. For this virtual meeting, the technology moderator will be Sarah Caper, Principal Planner with Forward Pinellas. The process coordinator will be myself, Tina Jablon, Executive Administrative Secretary for Forward Pinellas. Any person may be heard by the Forward Pinellas Board for not more than three minutes on any proposition before the board unless such time is modified by the chair. The options and methods for doing that will be explained in a moment. To ensure an accurate record of the meeting when addressing the board, the member of the public must first state and spell his or her name and state his or her address and announce which agenda item they will be speaking to. Throughout the meeting, we will ask that all presenters and commenters identify themselves by name each time they speak unless they have been introduced or specifically called on by name. Additionally, please be mindful of not speaking over one another. Prior to a vote on any matter, the chair will seek public comment. The technology moderator or the process coordinator will then ask for virtual hand raising of all those wishing to speak on an item. The number of hands will be noted and reported to the chair. The technology moderator will then unmute each speaker in turn in the order that is shown by Zoom, allowing each speaker three minutes or such time that is modified by the chair. 
Finally, the chair may ask to seek more information from Ford Pinellas staff, the presenter or other sources. For each item requiring a vote, the board member making the motion should identify themselves clearly and state their motion. The board member making the second should also identify themselves clearly and state and second the motion. All votes will be accomplished today by a roll call vote. We ask that everyone please silence all their cell phones and other noise making devices and remain on mute when not speaking. We also ask that we allow all presentations to finish in their entirety before making questions or comments. And at this time, Wit, I will turn it over to you for the recognitions and announcements. Okay, good afternoon, board members. Thank you uh, for being here today. Welcome to the public uh, who all is out there. Um, I would like to start with uh, an introduction of Austin Britt, who is our uh, new intern for the year. He's a student, he's a graduate student in uh, the University of uh, South Florida's uh, Urban and Regional Planning Program. He's a second year student. And we're excited to have him here. He's already been given uh, a bunch of assignments uh, on the MPO side of the house, but he'll be working on both uh, land use and transportation and the integration of the two. Uh, he and I had a long conversation, about an hour. I made him late for a meeting, I think, yesterday or day before, and um, we had a really nice discussion. And um, we're excited to have him. It's for a two-semester period, so this is a business agreement that we've uh, signed with uh, the university, and it's the first time doing this, but we think having Austin here for uh, two semesters will really allow him to contribute and get a lot of learning out of this program. And he asked me yesterday when we talked, what do, what do I want out of this? And I said, I really want you to just really grow and learn and experience a full range of, of planning issues here at Ford Pinella. So that's what we're hoping for. And I'll just turn it over to Austin to say a couple of words real quick. Yeah, thank you, Owit. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to, to see you all in person. Um, I've heard a lot of great things about all of you, and I've seen a lot of the work that you guys have done here. And, and I am I am really honored to be able to be a part of, of making a difference here in Pinellas County. Um, and I'm excited to get the opportunity to kind of bring this partnership between Forward Pinellas and the University of South Florida. Um, so that, that's really all I wanted to say is just hello, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'll just add that um, Austin has unique training to be an urban planner, especially working with boards and, and the public. He used to be a, uh, a teacher in the middle school level. So um, he knows all about um, communicating and getting people to do things. Well, Austin, uh, on behalf of the board, welcome. It's good, great to have you. We're excited. I know this is a, it's a really, I mean, if I were, I never had this opportunity when I was young and, and in your shoes. So this is just uh, you got a great staff to work with and and wits leading a really um, awesome group uh, regionally and around the state and um, so I know you're, you're going to get a lot out of this and I know I, I really appreciate your comments as a kind of a uh, a little bit of an ambassador from the university and trying to set the stage for future people to have future students to have the opportunity so looking forward to working with you and again welcome good to have you um, and we just want to take the opportunity also to uh, congratulate you on being elected to the, Amer uh, the APA, American Planning Association's Florida chapter, president-elect of the Florida chapter. Um, you've been involved at the national level before, uh, but and again, this one, you're going to get a chance to represent 2,500 planners from around the state. Um, and um, really excited about that. I think, it, I think it gives us an opportunity, kind of shed some light on, on this region, this area, but also on, on Forward Pinellas. But you probably got that a little bit because of their background and what you've done here at Forward Pinellas. So we're continue to be very proud of you and the work that you do here. Um, I know your primary responsibility will be uh, heading the policy committee uh, and working uh, at the, uh, the national conference or the conference up in uh, Tallahassee. But um, Really, just really wanted to say congratulations. Uh, an awesome opportunity. I think two years after that, you'll be then the president of the uh, Florida chapter. I know it's going to take a little extra of your time, uh, but I'm sure you'll balance it all just perfectly well and look forward to uh, seeing great things out of you for that organization, but also for, for our organization. So again, congrats, uh, Wit. And if you wanted to say something, that'd be great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to say. Our state conference is starting today. And so some of our staff will be participating today, tomorrow and, and Friday. And um, 750 people out of those 2,500 have enrolled in the virtual conference this year. Um, so I think it's a great organization. Uh, 
we do have a, a good voice, I think, in Tallahassee. We have an executive director based in Tallahassee. And um, there's a lot going on. In fact, one of the things I'll be charged with is helping select the next executive director because she'll be retiring in a couple of years. So uh, there's a lot going on and uh, it's an honor and a privilege to serve in this capacity. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, look, again, congrats, Whit. Um, uh, any, uh, anybody else? Uh, well, I didn't see any other hands that if anybody wanted to say anything, but um, we, can, uh, we can move on. Uh, Sarah, you'll let me know. I can't see everybody, of course, but um, we'll move into the consent agenda. And uh, is there, first, is there any uh, members that want to pull any of the items from the consent agenda up? I, I, now I do see Julie ward Bujowski raising her hand on the, on, on the board here. So uh, Commissioner or Mayor Bujowski, did you have uh, anything? I did the, the, the budget item. I mean, normally we would, that would not be on um, approving our budget wouldn't be under consent for the benefit of the folks watching. So I'd just like to see that pulled and presented. Sure, we can do that. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you. It uh, looks Anybody? like Commissioner Long has her hand raised. Um, commissioners and board members, please, and if you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom because it's hard to see your faces with so many of you, but um, Commissioner Long. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to let you know that there are some speakers that wanted to speak at our meeting today and, and for whatever reason they are not able to access our meeting and so if there's someone of you on staff that can provide direction, I think that would be helpful. Thank you, David. Bye bye. Yeah, yeah, I just I just got that uh, message as well from Todd Pressman who um, he had some people that wanted to speak today but he can't access the meeting so um, Sarah, what, what is your suggestion? Um... So um, the simplest way, I think, for people looking to access the meeting, if you already have computer access, is to go to the Forward Pinellas website. And if you actually open up the agenda for today, it's under agendas. Um, in the top right corner of the agenda, there's a link that says virtual meeting info that takes you directly to the Zoom as an attendee. All members of the public who join that way will be joining as attendees. And when it comes time for public comment, you can raise your hand. We also have some call-in information and I'm just gonna um, look up unless Tina, you have it available, the exact number for the call-in. Okay. I do have that number up if we need to. I was gonna forward the invite to Mr. Pressman so he can get it. Okay, that would be great, Tina, either way. That'd be good. Go ahead and do that if you would, make it a little easier for him. And his, um, right his and his clients. Um, anybody else that had anything to pull from the consent? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the consent is the approval of the minutes, um, approval of committee appointments, acceptance of the quarter three financial report, the map, map adjustment from the city of Safety Harbor, and a, a, approval of procurement uh, for planning consultants, Approval of interlocal agreements for planning and placemaking grants for the City of Pinellas Park, City of St. Petersburg. Um, two different ones for City of St. Petersburg. Approval of interlocal agreement for complete streets grant with the City of Pinellas Park. Approval of amendment to the corridor enhancement grant with City of St. Petersburg. And cancellation of the December forward Pinellas meeting. Uh, the other item was approval of the amended resolution uh, 2005 in the annual budget. And that one has been pulled uh, to be discussed separately. Um, so uh, let's see, does, uh, uh, Sarah, do you have anybody from the public that would like to speak to these items? Any members of the public wishing to address the board on the consent items, except for the one that was pulled, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom, or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine. Give people a moment if they'd like to speak. I see no one wishing to speak on these items. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess at this point, unless there's any further board com uh, discussion, I'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Uh, excuse me, I do see a hand raised from the public now. Okay. Would you like me to allow them to speak? Yeah, let's get, do you have the motion or a motion and the seconder? I have there, uh, you... Paul Britton and Welch. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead and accept the uh, the person. 
Sure, this is a phone call listener. 727-483 is the beginning of the phone number and I will allow you to speak at this time. Please say your name, spell it, your address, and then the item you're speaking about. You'll have three minutes once it begins. You should be able to speak now. You have to unmute if you are muted. Hello, can you hear me? This is David Ballard Geddes Jr. Yes, we can hear you. If you could please uh, great, thank you. spell your name, your address, and the item you're speaking on. Uh, my name is David Ballard Geddes Jr. G E D D I S. I live on 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor, and I would like to address the uh, downtown Palm Harbor master plan, um, if I may. Excuse me, sir, that item is later on the agenda. It's not part of the consent. This, uh, David, this is just going to be the consent agenda. That'll be coming up uh, later on in the meeting, and you can speak at that point on that item. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to be so interruptive. No, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. We'll talk to you in a little bit, David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else? I see no other attendees with their hand raised. Mayor, okay. do have um, Mayor Kennedy's hand raised? Okay. Mayor Kennedy? I was just going to make the motion, but they I guess they beat me to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Man. They did. Okay. Seeing nobody else, we'll have a roll call, please. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Councilmember Rice? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Mayor Bradbury? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Eggers? Aye, and the motion carries uh, seven ayes and six and five yeses. Uh, it actually carries unanimously. Um, Sorry about that, I had to just throw that in. Um, all right, uh, we'll move on to the uh, consent agenda and um, no, wait, excuse me, apologize. I'm looking at the wrong spot. We're now gonna move into the public hearing part of our agenda. And we had, uh, we'll uh, Chairman, we had one item pulled. We've got to go back to that pulled item. Oh, thank, thank you. Three you, yeah. J. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to that uh, amended resolution and annual budget uh, item. Whit, go ahead. I'll let Rodney speak to this, but I just wanted to let you know first that um, you've already approved the budget. Uh, we took a public vote on that back in July. So this is um, an amendment uh, that came up uh, as a result of the um, uh, OMB estimates of revenue. So Rodney, if you'll handle that. Uh, thanks, Whit. Uh, good afternoon, uh, board members. Uh, as Whit noted, this is actually a, an amendment to the resolution that you adopted uh, back in July. Uh, and it is to reflect more revenue that is uh, projected based on uh, the final calculations from the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, it's actually a bit of good news in that our budget uh, revenues will be increased by about $39,000. And uh, we have placed that money, that new money, if you will, in our reserve line item. And so the Office of Management and Budget has asked that we have our board adopt an amended resolution to reflect this new uh, revenue. Okay. Uh, Mayor Bujalski, did you have anything else, any questions um, on that? No, I'm just happy to hear it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, need a, need a, uh, um, to approve. Any... Oh, Second. Okay. okay. Did you get that? I have Mayor Bradbury and Vice Mayor Sofer. Okay. And Sarah, see if there's anybody on the line that would like to speak to the item. Any members of the public who wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the raised hand button in Zoom, or if you're on the phone, hit star nine at this time. I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. 
Okay, and we have a motion and a second, so we do a roll call on that one item, please. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. <clears throat> Aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Council Member Rice. Yes. Commissioner Welch. Aye. Commissioner Seal. Yeah. Mayor Bradbury. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Eggers. Aye, and that motion carries unanimously. Um, Tina, before we jump into the um, into the uh, public hearings, um, I'm just getting a text again uh, that said that no, uh, he, he uh, Todd Pressman did not get the number or the additional invite. He said no, and the Zoom agenda will not load. So I don't know if it's on our end or on his end, but. Um, if, if um, anyone is having trouble, um, can you, you can, can you state the phone number? Yes. So there are multiple phone numbers. The first one you could dial is 312-626-6799. That's 312-626-6799. The next one is another phone number. That's 646-558-8656. Once you dial those numbers, you will need the webinar ID, which is 885-3247-7408. That's 885-3247-7408. And the information where you can find these is um, if you go to the Forward Pinellas website to the calendar, in the calendar invitation for today, we list these phone numbers, the webinar ID, and the link. Okay, let's see if that see if that works. Uh, wait to hear wait to hear from him in a little bit. Uh, we're going to first do the uh, MPO uh, public hearing, um, and then followed uh, up with uh, three PPC public hearings. So we'll go first to uh, Jensen um, Hackett of FDOT uh, to give us um, his uh, uh, roll forward amendment uh, tip action, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, board members. This is uh, Jensen Hackett with the Department of Transportation. And as uh, the chair said, I will be going over the annual roll forward amendment with you today. So at the end of the state fiscal year in June, the department runs a report that finds any projects that are within the DOT work program that were not committed in the previous fiscal year, in this case being state fiscal year 20, and then rolls these projects into the new state fiscal year, which is fiscal year 21. In order to make sure that these projects are continued in next year's Ford Pinellas TIP, the one that begins with the federal fiscal year on October 1st, we ask for this amendment to include these projects within that new TIP that will take effect on October 1st. This amendment will not affect any other projects that are within the current Ford Pinellas TIP, nor the TIP that will become effective on October 1st. Uh, the three projects that are uh, as part of this year's roll forward are included in your agenda packets. And for this amendment, I will need a motion for approval and then a subsequent vote. And as always, I can answer any questions that you may have at this time. Okay. Um, are there any questions uh, for Jensen? I'm not seeing any questions. Um, any, any folks from the public that would like to speak to this item? Any members of the public wishing to address the board, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or press star nine on the phone. Okay. Um, I see no members of the public, but um, I do see Vice Chair Rice's hand raised. Darden, did you have something or were you making a motion? I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, Both both um i'll make the motion to accept but i i did just while we had an fdop representative here i was wondering if mr jensen or or wit wanted to comment on any updates we might have about the bud fdot's budget for the work plan um that may be reduced um because of the budget this year and what that means for pinellas county 
that would be fine. Can somebody give a second on that, please? I'll on second the, it. Okay. Jensen, if um, you wanna, I can go ahead and try and address that, and you all can jump in if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, we, we actually have uh, Secretary Gwynn um, is online okay. as well, so Perfect. he can talk to it as well. Yeah. We'll go there. Hear me? Yes. Sorry, we didn't. We missed the question. The question was what? if you could um, maybe just provide a little bit of insight into the revenue um, shortfalls and what that may mean for District Seven. Okay, sure. And and um, it's a timely topic because we're right now in the process of going through our our numbers. Um, most of you probably saw the revenue estimating conference uh, showed a large decrease in um, the gas tax revenue as well as some of the other areas like rental car surcharge, dock stamps, uh, tolls for our turnpike. Um, and so they've all gone down quite a bit. Um, the way our program works is uh, the work uh, or, the, or the, the budget and the money that we have for this year, a good portion of it is to pay off obligations and commitments made in previous years. So that's always our first commitment is to make sure we don't let any ongoing project get uh, impacted. And then our debt service is the second thing that we keep. The third thing that we try to keep um, from any harm is the uh, uh, preservation, like our resurfacing and um, bridge uh, rehab and those types of projects as well as safety projects. And then what we have to do is look at after all that's protected, what um, do we have to do to uh, protect the work program and be able to stay within our budget? Um, what that typically means is our capacity projects, we have to look hard at to see whether we have to move some of those out. But what I can tell you is, is one, it wasn't as bad as we had feared it might have been. So um, we've been gaming, and uh, the other thing is, is the approach we're most likely to take is we're not going to um, cancel projects or to, um, to, to take projects and just kind of put them up on the shelf. What we'll probably do is try to move everything out a little bit. So it may be that projects have to move out. Uh, some projects may move out a few months. Others may move out a year. But we don't see anything where you'd have a, a project that would have to wait four or five years to, uh, to, 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 to get uh, back on, on track. But we're, we're hopeful that um, depending on how the, the recovery comes, if the, if the revenue estimating conference comes back later and is a little more optimistic than they were in the last um, projection, that maybe we can start to move some of those in. So we don't know yet. We hope by sometime the end of September, perhaps in October, that will um, have our allocations for all the districts. And at that point, um, we'll start to talk to you all and others about uh, potential opportunities to, to move some things around. I know that's not a lot of concrete detail, but right now that's about what we have. Um, last, last year, we had some shortfalls from, uh, I think it was the storm and a couple things got pushed back a little bit. Do you see those items being pushed back further? Like, for instance, Curlew and US 19 overpass? So, what, what, um, and I'll be working closely with our central office uh, budget and work program people. My, my hope would be projects that had previously been impacted by the, re the rescission, I guess they called it, which was uh, where we had to, to, one, we had the storm, but then we also had a, the revenue estimating conference prior to the pandemic had estimated gas tax revenues falling due to uh, fuel efficiency and uh, greater uh, number of electric vehicles. Um, we had to move some things out. I would try to keep those from moving out before we would move out projects that had not previously been impacted. I, I'm, I'm not sure I followed that. I'm sorry. Um, you, say that last part again. Okay, the so, um, uh, so, uh, the projects that were moved out a year, say, uh, last year prior to the pandemic because of 
the rescission, which right. was the reduction in revenue. I would try to not impact those until after projects that haven't yet been impacted. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. A little thick. Uh, does anybody, um, while we have David here, does anybody have any qu other qu questions for him? Uh, uh, Mayor Bujalski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Secretary, for the update. And thanks, Jordan, for asking for it. Uh, just a quick question. The revenue estimating conference, is that an annual thing? They meet, um, well, they, they typically meet, uh, I believe it's every six months, um, but they can meet more frequently depending on the, the current situation. So, um, but I believe that it's typically every six months. Um, okay, so, so the last time they met was what, six uh, in July, you said, I think? It was in August. August. So they just recently met, yes. Okay, so sometime in the beginning of the year. Correct. That's probably when they'll meet again, unless for some reason they were asked to, to provide an interim update. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Secretary, for that update. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Tina, did we, uh, did we, or uh, Sarah, did we go to the public on this? I know we had a motion in a second, but did we go to the public? Yes, we did. Okay, then let's do it. Go ahead and do a roll call. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Council Member Rice. Yes. Commissioner Welch. Aye. Commissioner Seal. Yeah. Mayor Bradbury. Aye. Commissioner Long. Yes. Commissioner Eggers. Aye, and that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the PC, PPC portion of the public meetings. And again, I have a um, script here I got to read. I will first um, um, ask for Pinell staff to present items. We have three today. Applicant local governments are available for questions if you have any. Once each presentation is given, I will ask for proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents, and finally any other citizens who wish to comment or ask questions on the case. We will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions and then I will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. And um, I know David uh, Gap Ballard Geddes Jr. was on the line earlier, and this is just so you know, David, this is the one that we be one of the. I think it's actually the second one, the second public hearing that you'll be interested in. But go ahead, uh, Nasheem, if you if you can't, go ahead, Nasheem. Good afternoon, board members. For the record, Nasheem Rahman, board Pinellas. The first case I will be presenting is CW 20-13, submitted by Pinellas County. The county seeks to amend properties from the residential very low category to the residential rural category. And the purpose of the proposed amendment is to recognize the rural low density character of the East Lake Tarpon community within which this amendment area is located. The amendment area is generally east of Lake Tarpon, west of Booker, Brooker Creek Preserve, south of the Pasco County boundary and north of Tampa Road with an area size of approximately 2,919.5 acres. Its existing uses are primarily residential with surrounding uses, including preservation and recreation open space lands. The proposed amendment will involve the reincorporated residential rural category in the countywide plan rules. And for context to this, the East Lake Tarpon Community Overlay was established in 2012 by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners as a means to maintain the community's low density residential character and expansive open space. In February of this year, the BCC requested the restoration of the residential rural category that was eliminated during the major update of the countywide plan in 2015. The residential rural category was readopted in the countywide plan rules in August of this year so that local governments could choose to apply this category in rural low density areas within their jurisdiction. 
The proposed amendment would not change the permitted uses of the area, but would result in a reduction of the allowable residential density of the parcels involved to 0 0.5 units per acre. The following images are to give you an idea of the expansive open space within the amendment area. The two images in front of you are a residential neighborhood located just off of Forelock Road. The next two images are facing north and south of East Lake Road. And lastly, are images of another residential neighborhood located just off of Keystone Road. The following map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map category of residential very low, along with its permitted uses listed on the table in the slide. This next slide shows the same map, but shows you the density and intensity standards of the current category. Again, the proposed amendment does not intend to change the permitted uses in the amendment area, but rather recognize the low density character of the area by reducing the allowable residential density, hence the proposed amendment to residential rural, which is shown on the map in front of you on this slide. Again, the permitted uses are listed on the slide, and as you can see, these permitted uses have not changed from the residential very low category. However, this next slide shows the density and intensity standards of the residential rural category. And as you can see, the maximum allowable residential density is 0 0.5 units per acre. One of the countywide considerations taken into account is location of an amendment area in a scenic non-commercial corridor or SNCC. This amendment area is located on an SNCC with rural open space and residential classifications. However, the proposed amendment category of residential rural is consistent with these classifications. To conclude, the proposed amendment is, is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the residential rural category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Listed in front of you is an analysis of those relevant countywide considerations. And lastly, there were no public comments for KCW 20-13 concluding this presentation. Okay. Um... Nasheen, just so um, we had a couple of calls to the office today, P people were wanting to make sure that they understood that the two categories, uh, uh, the, if you could just explain that one, the rural category is the one unit for two acres and the, and the very low is one unit per one acre, um, just confirming that. So folks can understand that we're moving from one, one per acre back to one per two acres, which is way it had been and fell through the cracks when we did the when we did the adjustments back in 2016. Uh, we we went I don't remember the number of categories, but we had 40 categories and we we dropped it down to a more efficient number. I think somewhere between 15 and 20. And that one is kind of one of those unintended consequences that we just didn't catch. And so we're just trying to get it back to where it was so that we can protect the nature of the of the community that has had that uh, overlay protection for for years. So. But I just want to make sure that the category designation is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions for staff? Uh, uh, Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I'm, I'm more so of a comment on this. Is now the appropriate time for me to make that? Um, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I just want to thank staff for working with me on this in advance. Um, really appreciate all the background and your efforts on this. It was very detailed, as always. Um, we already touched on this a couple months ago. Um, and so I know I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in opposition to this, but I just wanted to give some more background and kind of reiterate my positions. So what originally spurred the creation of the East Lake overlay was an unsuccessful involuntary annexation attempt by the city of Oldsmar back in 2009. Obviously the overlay was created a couple of years later, but that's kind of what spurred the first, you know, reaction from the East Lake community of looking around and saying, wait a minute, we need to protect ourselves. We need to reach out to our representatives and make sure that we're not being encroached and our rural way of life isn't being, um, you know, destroyed by surrounding cities that want to, be imperialistic and start grabbing up our properties. So fast forward to last year, a developer reached out to the city of Tarpon Springs, contiguous with our city border, 
and it was completely voluntary and completely legal. They, they, there were no property owners that were forced to annex. It was just 100% a developer who developers land and they wanted to annex into our city. So we allowed them to annex and the density is one unit per acre, which again, I'd remind the board, we live in the most densely populated county in the state. One unit per acre is incredibly rural. Um, and it's far more rural than the vast majority of this map. If you look at the map on the PowerPoint, you don't have to pull it up, but I mean, so many of these are just skirting it. They're skirting the density calculation because they have golf courses in their suburb neighborhood. And so the golf course is making that calculation way out of whack. And our one unit per acre development is far more rural than the majority of these. So really I'm opposed to the role category being introduced for three reasons. Um, the first one I just touched on, it's because calling this area rural or low density is entirely incorrect for the vast majority of it. Um, you're including duplexes, cookie cutter suburbs, mini mansions stacked on top of each other. You even saw it in the PowerPoint pictures. Um, these are suburbs. And the reason that the suburbs are considered half a unit per acre or rural in the first place, again, it's just because they have that golf course addition, which adds hundreds of acres into the calculation. And these houses themselves are like 10 feet from each other. I could toss a bowling ball from house to house to house to house. Um, and again, I mean, it even includes duplexes. Uh, the second reason I'm opposed to it is just because of the principle. Since the inception of the East Lake overlay, the city of Tarpon Springs has never performed an involuntary annexation. We've never attempted an involuntary annexation. It's city policy not to perform involuntary annexations. We don't wanna get any property that doesn't 110% want to be with the city of Tarpon Springs. The only way we're annexing a property in this area is if they reach out to us and they, it's, you know, let's say a developer and they own 110% of the area that they're trying to develop and they can work with us from there. We have never and will never do an involuntary annexation, which was the original point of creating the overlay in the first place. Um, so really it kind of begs the question from the city of Tarpon Springs perspective is that why are we being you know, punished by the county for this? This is all being spurred on by the developer that contacted us last year to get the development. We annexed it, the development's moving forward. And there were a lot of upset voters in the East Lake area who looked around and said, wait a minute, we're next. They're gonna start to try to land grab us, which just isn't the case. We've never done an involuntary annexation. We're not gonna do it now. Um, so, I mean, essentially it just sets a really bad precedent for other cities. And I think that's really the main thing that the board needs to take away from this is that in the future, if you perform an annexation that's completely legal and completely voluntary, the county is gonna step forward and overstep and put handcuffs on you in future processes and say, okay, well, this density is gonna to have to carry over. So it's gonna discourage any developers from wanting to annex into our area. Um, so again, I, I think it's a really dangerous precedent that we're setting by passing this. Um, and frankly, I don't really know why we're being punished for a developer legally and voluntarily wanting to come into the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, well, I'd be glad to respond to some of that. Um, well, first and foremost, this, this has been the category that's been in place for, for some time. Um, the Oldsmar annexation issue with the had nothing to do with the north end of the uh, north end of East Lake, which is where this is. This is a different area than the the piece from Oldsmar. Um, the, the community, uh, with protection of the countywide plan, uh, felt that one unit per two acres is what was consistent with what they wanted. Whether it's a common a large common area from a golf course or a preserve area that uh, another community could create, um, a park setting within a community they could create, whatever that turns out to be. That was, that was the motivation from the original. It was a mistake that changed it to give financial incentives to developers to annex. If there was a countywide plan that was still in place at a half unit per acre, like it was, then the then and, and the and the um, and the developer still wanted to annex. He could. There would be no financial incentive for him not to do it. He could still do that. We're not stopping that. We're just simply trying to correct a mistake that was made when the consolidate. In my opinion, this mistake was made 
when we consolidated the number of categories and putting it back to where it was. Uh, again, doesn't keep anybody from annexing. Um, the one unit per acre, they can still they do, they can do one unit per two acres and still annex into, into the city of Tarpon Springs. It doesn't matter. Uh, they just won't get the additional financial incentive that they haven't had up until 2016. And that's, that, that's what the change that was made um, that uh, provided that additional incentive. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's trying to rectify an issue for that community and for that area. So I don't think it's picking on Tarpon Springs per se. I think it's just trying to fix a, a correct a mistake. That's my opinion. Whit, did you have any, uh, any other comments? I do not have any other comments at this time. Okay, um, any other board members? Looks like you have Mayor Kennedy. Okay, um, again, try to hit that. Um, um, I, I don't eight. know why, but- Oh, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy, go ahead. Were ever any kind of a formal vote taken for or, or against this from the city of Tarpon Springs? Or they were never involved in anything like that because of the having to do with the county? Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about uh, on this on this particular item that we're voting on. In the past, uh, the the countywide plan is a is is a is a we sit as a is the, the county commission sits. I'm not. I'm not um, because the the commissioner feels so strong about it, I was just wondering how the rest of his commission felt about it. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm thank sorry. you. No, uh, the board unanimously approved the annexation, and I'm I'm very certain that the consensus of the board is that um, this is going to really hinder any future possible annexations, and it's an overstep. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Mayor Bradbury, go ahead. Uh, yes. So this was, if I'm understanding this right, this was annexed into the city, correct? When you say this, what are you talking about? The, the, they annexed some property into the city out of the county. Correct. And they, uh, the, the city wanted to allow a developer to develop the property. Yeah, underneath they, they, the city's rules and regulations. Be, yeah, because the new countywide plan um, had been changed from one unit per two acres to one unit per acre. So that uh, when the developer came to the county for a one unit per acre development, they, we don't, in that area, the county was, is, has a, has a, a their own, um, um, uh, I'm not sure what the category is called, but a one unit per two acres, that's what they had. So the developer said, oh, well, the countywide plan allows for one unit per acre. And let me go look at the city of Tarpon Springs. And they went to the city of Tarpon Springs because city of Tarpon Springs has a one unit per acre density um, category. So that, and it was protected by the countywide plan and they went through the process um, and uh, that, 44 acres, I think it was approximately, was indeed annexed into the city of Tarpon Springs. While this new setup between 2016 and today, in that period of time, that, that, that category came forward. And so when you look at the entire East Lake area, including um, the developments that have golf courses that are abutting the city of Tarpon Springs, People in that area who are under the have been protected under the one unit per two acres by the countywide plan through 2016 and now no longer are are concerned about that it, it, continuing movement and not by the city of Tarpon Springs. I'm not saying that the individual property owners going to the city of Tarpon Springs to have the additional density that is that is not allowed in the in the county area. Not the countywide plan piece. I'm just talking about the county areas where we are at one unit per two acres. So they 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 but they but if they're looking for additional density, they have they can't get it 
at the county, they have to go to the city. So what we're trying to do in the countywide plan is put it back to where it was previous to 2016 so that that area that we're now defining is again protected by the countywide plan at one unit per two acres. That's, that's what we're trying to do. So um, over, over Tarpon Springs ruling. No, Tarpon the Springs, they the, annexation, the, the annexation that Tarpon Springs has had just done is stays in place. That doesn't change. Okay. So um, just so you know, go ahead. Is this area that um, part of their planning area? Take a look at the, the map there. Yes, and I mean, because it, I, I have the map on my other screen and I don't see a defined line saying from here up is Tarpon Springs planning area from here down remains county. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be east and west. So I'd like to have somebody oh, from yeah. staff. Yeah, somebody right, from can staff. Explain. Yeah. Um, as you can see in the map in front of you, thank you, Sarah, for pulling it up. Um, the portions of unincorporated in county are all in this light beige color. This is the amendment area. It's just a little bit darker, so you can distinguish it because it is it does have such irregular boundaries. But Tarpon Springs, any of their jurisdiction is highlighted over here in blue. And I believe this is the Lake Tarpon, so in case you confuse it with um, the Tarpon Springs jurisdiction. But all of this in blue are parts that are adjacent to Tarpon Springs. So there's enclaves throughout that area, it looks like that, then. That, I, if I I'm believe. reading that correctly. I believe that blue area that she just described, uh, Mayor, is the is the 44 uh, the 44 acres that was just annexed in the last year or two. I can't remember exactly the time frame. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, that would have been unincorporated county uh, and part of the one unit per two acre uh, protected area in the county plan. Now the county wide plan. Uh, then is only one unit per acre. And that gave them the opportunity to try to see if they could annex that area and get that additional density. So you can you can see that, I think that's the piece, am I correct? No, just, just one parcel of that blue area is what we annex. That, uh, the rest of that blue area, especially down, um, you know, more west, that, that's always been tarpon. Yeah, that, that's always been. I'm talking about the one at the top, that area. That's, that's too big, it'd just be a parcel that That's 44 not, acres it's not it's not a small piece i can't remember right. exactly where it starts i mean that's that's a big piece of map though it's bigger than 44 acres right there it is the amendment area is 2900 acres so i'm commissioner donovan you're referring to a, a portion probably within where the sarah's board. cursor is yes ma'am right. so reading this correctly then it's the county is changing their um, density back to its original intent. The countywide plan would be changed, correct, back to the one unit per two acres. That category has been established. Now the county is asking that the countywide plan reflect these areas back to one unit per two acres. And then if Tarpon Springs annexes them, then Tarpon, they'll follow Tarpon Springs rules and regulations in the future. If Tarpon Springs wants to, if this if this passes, and and then it goes to the countywide planning authority, and we pass it next month, then they could, these areas can still seek annexation. They just have to seek annexation at one unit per two acres instead of the one unit per acre that that, that Tarpon Springs allows for. So what we've done, I think, and again, which, uh, staff can correct me. In a previous action, we recreated the category, one unit per two acres. Now the county is coming and asking that this area that you see here, that was one unit per two acres on the countywide plan, but got changed to one unit per acre, be changed back to one unit per two acres. Let me ask you a hypothetical question then. Mm -hmm. If the county is going to do this as the planning authority, then they could do that to a city and say, this property is zoned T. So if you annex it into the city, you're going to have to keep it as T. 
Yeah. Mayor, these actions would have to be initiated by a local government. So in this case, Pinellas County it, it uh, initiated this action, and it's being and it's coming to our board based on Pinellas County's initiation. So if we were to apply this category anywhere else in the county, you'd have to have a local government initiate that action. Well, the county would be the local government. Not everywhere, though. Only in unincorporated Pinellas County. The county and unincorporated Pinellas County is scattered throughout the county. That's correct. I'm at the reason why I'm asking this is because it sounds like a precedence is being set where they could come in later to a property that is in within the planning area of Pinellas Park that's zoned T and tell us that we have to keep it zone T instead of letting somebody buy two T properties and making it into a single family home. Is it, that it, not we, correct? We, is we, this not we, a precedence we, that's being set? We could not affect the Pinellas Park, in, in, anything in Pinellas Park's city limits. That, you'd have to bring no, that. No, Okay, go ahead. No, you're not. No, this, these are properties that are outside of Pinellas Park city limits, but right. that are in our planning area uh -huh. that are zoned T. I'm just using that as an example that are zoned T that might want to annex into Pinellas Park and not be a T anymore. Right. You would still have to have the county initiate that action and then it would have to come to this board and we would have a debate about that. Um, and, and that would go through a separate process. So I'm not sure I agree that there's a precedent being set here. Um, you know, the county can take any action on land uses within an incorporated county, whether this happens or not. Um, so it would really be um, a process of reviewing that uh, proposed land use change here at Ford Pinellas and having recommendations of our advisory committee uh, before the, anything like that could happen. So it's, in my view, it's not a precedent. But they're forcing Tarpon Springs to, if they annex it, to keep it the same. All they're doing is they're applying um, that lower density to the unincorporated county as identified in this map. To Commissioner Egger's point, that was the case until August of 2015, where they had that category. But that once it would have, in 2016, if it would have gotten annexed into the city of Tarpon Spring, Tarpon Springs would have been able to change the zoning. Well, no, they just went to the established the zoning zone. surrounding it. Would they not have been able to change it to match what's surrounding it already? So the county, had, the county had an overlay district established that artificially lowered the density in an incorporated county in that location. When, they, when that property was annexed into the city of Tarpon Springs, that overlay, which is an ordinance of Pinellas County, didn't go with the annexation. So all it did was go to the new category of one unit per acre. That's what they're trying to avoid is they're trying to prevent another annexation where the overlay district exists. And, and 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 has existed for for a while, right? Um, and and they're just we're trying to get it back to where it was when we did this consolidation. Um, and I and I raised my hand as one of the people. I just get, went right past me that you know I didn't staff didn't point out what was happening, and I voted to to make that change. And then the unintended consequences came, you know, barreling at us that. My gosh, the whole thing that we've worked at to have a one unit per two acre overlay for that area is now not, it, it, it's still there unless somebody wants to bring a, an, an annexation effort with an overriding countywide planet that's now at one unit per acre. So we just trying to create the category, which we've done. I think in the previous meeting, we did that. So now we have that category available. Anybody has that category available to them. And, and we are asking it to be reapplied to the area that it was before the change in 2015 or 2016 when it happened. So that it doesn't change anything that has been done so far. It doesn't change anybody in the future from annexing. It just doesn't give them the one unit per acre that they want. They can, st they can still 
annex at one unit per two acres. They just can't annex at one unit per acre. That's, that's the difference. So, I mean, it doesn't stop annexation, it stops the incentive that was unintended, but was there based on the action four years ago. Excuse me, Chair, just to let uh, all of the board members know, Evan Johnson from Pinellas County is here if you have questions of him and he is a panelist, so able to speak. I, I just am a little confused because I've watched that um, area over the last 20 plus years change. And now all of a sudden you're gonna stop it when it's been changing for the last 20 years. I remember going single narrow two lane road going up into that area and there being cows around and not even any golf courses around, let alone homes and you know, I, I, I do miss it, but, you know, that's just how the county has progressed. And now you're stopping anybody else who owns property in that area from possibly changing, especially as those people that maybe have owned the properties for 75 years are now changing. Well, when, I, the cows, just, when the cows were there, Mayor, that I can tell you it was more than, it was a lot less than one unit per, I mean, you could probably have put one unit per 500 acres <laughs> back in those days. Yeah, of and course. this one unit per two acres is a very, you know, standard development uh, pattern in this, in this area. Uh, to, to what Commissioner Donovan said, a lot of it is included around either large park areas, golf courses, all of that, when you put it all together, it comes out to one unit per two acres. Uh, each of the properties themselves can be a unit, a half a unit, or one unit per half acre, one unit per acre, one unit per two acres. There's a varying sizes of those properties themselves, but the development itself incorporated a lot of common area that got the development to one unit per two acres. So, I mean, it, it, just golf courses for one. I mean, uh, large parks, if you go through uh, East Lake area, there's large park areas that are part of those numbers as well. So, um, and what happened in 2016 or 2015 is we, in, the, in trying to be more efficient in consolidating the number of countywide plan categories, this got caught up in it and it was, it was an oversight. And now, in my opinion, and we're trying to, get it back to where it was. And the only reason it came to our attention was in a specific example. And I think Commissioner Donovan spoke to the 44 acre annexation. And it was like, oh my gosh, we made a mistake in, not, in, in making that change in that cat or eliminating on the countywide plan, a unit per two acres. But we just, we just got rid of it. And plenty of those areas up there, plenty of those development areas have one unit per two acres. Not not have necessarily we, not necessarily the homes themselves, but the the development itself that was done it was done around the one unit per two acre concept, and it's all the way through there. And so the people that live up in that area said, "Hey, wait a minute, what happened? We've we've been having we've had this countywide plan. What happened? And it was a mistake made. And now they're, they're trying to get it back to where it was. That's sim as simple as it is. So we have heard from the homeowners in those neighborhoods then? Because we don't get that kind of backup material. Correct. Um, I believe we received 40 calls after sending out the public notices. And from what I heard, all 40 residents were in favor. Of it changing back? Correct. Okay. Commissioner Eggers, we have three board members with their hands raised. Okay. I can't see, so you call on them, please, Sarah. The first one is Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to touch on a couple of the comments uh, that were made. So essentially, I think the, the line of thinking is correct um, in that, you know, future developers are going to have to abide by this zoning now. So I think Commissioner Eggers, or sorry, Chair Eggers said perfectly that it's, it's just taking away all of the incentive. It, there's going to be no incentive for any developer to want to annex into the city of Tarpon Springs because this county zoning is going to completely bleed into everything that we do. 
and it really will have nothing to do with the county at that point if it's completely voluntary and completely legal. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's fair to frame it as a mistake. Um, just given that, you know, how far back can you go? You know, if it's, if, if, you know, 2016, the plan changed, but the old plan used to have it as this. I mean, I, I, I think it's all just spurred by this, by this one annexation. And a lot of residents were upset by it in that area, but it wasn't because they were being directly affected by it. They weren't being annexed. Nobody has ever or will be forced to annex in this area. They just didn't want new neighbors. Um, so, I mean, frankly, I don't, I don't think that you can go back in time and say, you know, well, in 2000, the density here was so-and-so. So that was the original intention. I, I don't think, you know, we can take a time machine and go back like that. I mean, it was all legal. It was all meeting that density at the time. Um, and I don't think it's, a, it, it wasn't a mistake until a bunch of residents got upset about it in Cypress Run, which again is a suburb with duplexes. And the only reason they meet that density requirement is because they have a huge golf course. Um, so, I mean, I, I just struggle with some of the logic there. Uh, to, to your point, it was a mistake because I was on the commission when I did it and didn't realize that I was doing that. So it was a mistake on my part to approve it. And I went, I, I'm going back four or five years. So I'm not, I'm not speaking of anything else. I'm speaking of this particular action. And uh, it got biased. And since nobody tested it until this 44 acre annexation occurred. And so it was like, oh my gosh. So yeah, it, it, was a, it was a mistake on my part. And that's why I said, in my opinion, I'm not speaking for any of the other six county commissioners that were there. So go ahead, I'm sorry. You said you had two others, Sarah? Yeah. Yes, first Commissioner Welch, then Mayor Bujalski. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I um, agree with the chairman, this was a mistake. And it's funny, I, I'm uh, cleaning out my office, as many of you know, and yesterday I was going through our old PPC files. <laughs> and uh, kind of reliving the annexation wars. And I, I guarantee you, Mayor Bradbury, nobody on the commission has any intent on going back to, to those annexation wars. Um, there's no intent to try to, to minimize what cities can do within their planning areas. But this is, uh, I view as a correction of a mistake. This got by all of us, not just Commissioner Eggers. And it's simply restoring the density that existed before 2016 for that overlay area in Eastlake. And this is what the citizens of Eastlake asked for. So I, I just simply see this as a restoration uh, for this specific area, but there's no plan to try to, to impede what cities can do in other planning areas. So I, I totally agree with uh, the chairman on this one. Thank you. We have Mayor Bujalski and then Commissioner Seal. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, Connor, can you, you mentioned earlier that um, you felt Tarpon is being punished, but this land that's being rezoned isn't in Tarpon. So can you just tell me how, why you feel that way? Is it for future potential annexations or? Exactly. It just destroys any incentive for any future developer or property owner to approach the city and say, hey, can I annex into you guys? Because, I mean, that's exactly what they're doing is they are hindering any future plans that any of those property developers or landowners, you know, whatever you want to call them, if they want to come annex into the city, that density from here on out is going to have to be followed. And I know that they say it's a correction, but at the end of the day, this is all spurred by a single voluntary legal annexation that happened last year. Um, and all the residents that called in about it, they were unaffected by it. They, they were not within the area that was being annexed. Okay, I understand now what, what your point was. Um, uh, I don't know if I, who I should ask this question to, maybe Wit. Um, <clears throat> Wit, this change doesn't stop somebody who owns the property in this area to build something, right? They can still build something in unincorporated county, right? Sure, they could. They would have to meet the density threshold of um, that, that Commissioner Eggers outlined, but it doesn't okay. stop and, development. And those owners of that land understand what's happening, correct? We, we did a mail out. Um, over 3,000 uh, individual parcels were mailed notice of this. So yes, they were given advance notice of this meeting. Not the neighbors. I mean, the owners of the land that you're re rezoning. 
Uh, yeah, I believe so. I mean, the, the property owners were given notice. That's what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not that they can't build something. They just can't annex into Tarpon. No, that's not true. They can't no, no, no. I'm sorry. I said it wrong. Stop. Stop. I know I said it wrong. <laughs> I don't want to cause confusion. It's not that they can't build on the property. They just can't get a better density um, and annex into Tarpon. They can still annex. They just have to have a lower density. Correct. Okay. And the gotcha. issue was previously it was only an overlay district and <laughs> those don't transfer with annexations. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. We have Commissioner Seal, then Commissioner Long. Um, I think Commissioner Welch um, explained it perfectly. Um, it was um, the request of the whole East Lake area to have this density and have this overlay, and it was very important to them. And as Witt has mentioned, if 3,000 owners were contacted and told that this is basically going back to what they wished, then that's what we're trying to do is to, um, um, to protect those homeowners who, um, bought or owned property within this area. As previously stated by Mayor Bajolski, it doesn't pr prevent anyone from continuing to annex into Tarpon. In fact, if they need water or sewer under all the annexation rules, they basically can annex because of the need for those services. So um, I believe that what all we're trying to do is to respect the homeowners in that area and to, um, you know, as stated previously, it was a mistake by the commission. And we had encouraged trying to um, countywide go to fewer districts, as you know, so zoning you know, categories and so on to try to um, make everything simpler. And in that regard, we honestly made a mistake. So we're just trying to rectify that. And um, thank you very much. Commissioner Long is next. Yes, uh, I don't wanna repeat what my colleagues have already said, but I couldn't agree with them more. And like Commissioner Welch, uh, probably Commissioner Seal as well. Uh, while I wasn't on the commission, I was on the Seminole City Council when we had the annexation wars. Now, never forget that huge meeting at the old Harborview Center. Uh, so I certainly hope that we don't find ourselves going back to that because it was very, very painful. And, um, and I'd like to think that we've moved beyond all that now. So let's just keep moving forward. Thank you. Commissioner Donovan has his hand raised. Okay, sorry, right, just, just one last comment. Um, again, the city of Tarpon Springs, it is our policy ever since the overlay started, we have never done an involuntary annexation. If 99 homeowners wanted to come into our city and one didn't, we wouldn't do it. It's all completely voluntary. So, I mean, I don't know about any annexation wars. I was probably in eighth grade when that happened. Um, <laughs> but uh, but again, we, we are all completely voluntary um, we respect the overlay entirely and again the annexation that we did pass was one unit per acre i mean it, it doesn't get much more rural than that in ellis county yeah hey, thanks for that and i certainly that's why i was trying to be very careful i was not trying to imply at all that uh, this was a annexation effort by city of tarpon springs but in any way so um anybody else uh, any of the board members before we open it up to the public I don't see any uh, additional. Uh, Sarah, go ahead and open, see if there's anybody in the public that would like to speak to this item. Okay, any proponents wishing to address the board at this time, please raise your hand by pressing the raised hand button or star nine on the phone. After proponents, we will ask for opponents and citizens wishing to be heard. And it looks like we have three proponents wishing to speak. I will allow you to speak in the order you raised your hand. When you have the ability to speak, please say and spell your name and your address, and you'll have three minutes. We'll first hear from Terry, then Mark, then we have a call in, and then Liz. So, Terry, I'm going to allow you to speak right now. Please state your name, address, and then you have three minutes. 
Hello, my name is Terry Wetzel, T-E-R-R-I, last name Wetzel, W-H-E-T-Z-E-L. My address is 2545 Royal Liverpool Drive, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34688. Thank you, Terry. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. I don't want to take a lot of time from anyone. Uh, Commissioner Eggers, I wanted to uh, reach out to you and Commissioner Seal, uh, Commissioner Long, also Commissioner Welch and the other Board of uh, County Commissioners who have worked very, very hard along with the Forward Pinellas team uh, to bring this to the place where it is. Uh, we first started down this road way back. At least I remember doing it with planning and zoning meetings at the city of Tarpon as far back, I believe, June or July of 2019. And I just wanted to let you know that there are um, many, many, many people who are very grateful uh, for the work that you're doing here in order uh, for us to be able to preserve the lifestyle that we have enjoyed uh, on our properties, being a resident for, uh, let's see, since 2006, um, I'm sitting here right now, I'm looking at a wide expanse of open area uh, from my family room, and I value that very much. Uh, the annexation actually is going to cause me to be able to see homes I never intended to see, but um, things happen, but I do really want to say thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for trying to do something to remove the incentive of developers to annex into a city for the sole purpose, as it appears, of being able to increase density on properties that they had a choice to buy or not to buy. Thank you again. Thank you. The next person um, with their hand raised is Mark Washburn. Mark, I will allow you to speak. Please state and spell your name and address. Hi, uh, Mark Washburn, uh, M-A-R-C-W-A-S-H-B-U-R-N at 124 East Lake Drive uh, in Tarpon, of course, not in the actual city. Um, I'm also the, um, the president of Save East Lake Inc. Um, we are an organization uh, 501, uh, 504, uh, 501-4C that um, is trying to help uh, organize a neighborhood um, because of what's been happening. And, and I wanted to ask, there's a map available on our website. Um, I'm not sure if that can be displayed to the people of the board. Which I'm shows sorry, we're not able to show anything um, that hasn't been sent to us in advance. Okay, that's fine. If you want to see it, it's at saveeastlake.org, O-R-G, and it's right on the front page, I believe. And it shows the annexations from the city that have been happening over the last several years. Um, there's more than just the 44 acres, by the way. Um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2017, a 70 acre parcel, the McAlpin property was also annexed. And for the same exact reason, the elder who owned the property had um, passed away and his son parted with a developer uh, and an investor. And they informed him that the best way to sell those 70 acres was to have it, uh, annexed by the city so they could raise the density uh, and bring it from uh, it, it's 30 something homes to a 70 plus home uh, development. Uh, it's I believe at, in the TRC in Tarpon Springs right now um, to put those homes in there. So that was four years ago roughly. And of course, in December of 2019, um, the developer Pioneer Homes saw that that annexation had extended a little snake-like arm so he bought a property, a small property that connected to it very minimally, but it's connected. And then he bought a larger parcel on the other side and he had them conjoined um, at the county level so he could um, get them annexed. Because of course the rules for annexation are, it has to be voluntary by the owner of the property. And two, um, um, the um, annexation has to be voluntary. And the second is it has to be touching and contiguous to the city which by doing that, it, it made it contiguous. Now on the map, if you do look at it, if you go to saveeastlake.org, you'll also see there are, I believe four different parcels for sale that touch this property. Um, they're all in the 10 to 14 acre range and they all have single family homes on them, possibly also a warehouse or barns. But what's happening now is the developer is wanting to purchase these properties 
raise the old homestead on the property, have it annexed, increase the density, and wash, rinse, and repeat. And unfortunately, the developer is, or it is a Tarpon Springs developer, where very well known, uh, George Stomas and George Zoot, has been around a long time. And um, they really don't care about the neighborhood. They care about what they can bring to the bank. So it's hurting our neighborhood. It's the density on this 44 acre parcel that really started this whole process, um, was supposed to have 22 homes on it, I believe. And by having it annexed, they're now going to build 88 homes. Oh, hello, Darden. We used to work together 15, 20 years ago. Nice to see you. Um, so anyways, so that's what brought our organization together. We have 200 members, about 95% of them live in this overlay area. And we're all opposed to this um, development, which leads us to being a proponent of this um, change to the um, land use plan. Thank you, Mr. Washburn. Your three minutes are up. Next, we have someone on the phone. The last four digits are 9693. I'm going to allow you to speak. Please state your name, spell it, and your address, and then you have three minutes. Uh, for the phone and caller, you have to unmute yourself. Hello. Now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. My, uh, my name is Lawrence McAmos. That's L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E. McAmos, M-C, capital A-M-I-S. I live at uh, 2343 Keystone Road, Tarpon Springs. Uh, my complaint, I've lived there for 35, 40 years, and it seems like this procedure is penalizing anybody that has 10, 15, 20 acres and has lived there for a while and hopes to maybe utilize the, the best use of their property. Uh, in order to uh, put in a golf course to keep the density as low as they're talking about, you must have 200 acres. If you have two, 300 acres, then, which I don't even know if it exists currently in this county, but if you have that, um, then you can proceed on, but as it stands, us, the people that have lived there for quite a while, I have currently have commercial property to the south of me, the city of Tarpon Springs to the west, the city of Tarpon Springs is to the north, and also to the east of us. And we're basically surrounded by the city of Tarpon Springs, and we would like to have the option to go into the city of Tarpon Springs with and maybe get the best value for our property. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one more proponent with their hand raised. Uh, Liz Lindsay, I'm gonna allow you to speak. Please state and spell your name and your address and then you'll have three minutes. Ms. Lindsay, you should be able to speak now. Ms. Lindsay, you are unmuted. It looks like we're having some technical trouble with Ms. Lindsay. I'm gonna to try to disable talking and allow you to speak again. Just one moment. Ms. Lindsay, you should be able to speak now. You have to unmute yourself. Ms. Lindsay, I'm going to lower your hand. If you're still here, can you raise it up again, please?
It doesn't appear that Ms. Lindsay is with us because our hand is not being raised again. We do have uh, someone else, a proponent wishing to speak. Oh, Ms. Lindsay's here. Ms. Lindsay, if you could unmute yourself. Sarah, did we have any other proponents? We have one more proponent, um, Nancy McInnes. Um, I can allow her to speak if you'd like us to try to work on the technical issues. Let's, let's go ahead and move on to that and then um, see if we can get the previous caller in after that. Okay. Let's keep moving along. Thank you. So Nancy McInnes, I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. You have to unmute yourself and then uh, please state and spell your name and give us your address and then you have three minutes. Okay. Hello, my name is Nancy McAmis. Um, MC, capital A-M-I-S, husband is Lawrence McAmis. Um, uh, I'm a teacher at school using Zoom, so I'm trying to do this. Um, it was kind of confusing when we received the notice in the mail. Um, it looked like you were going from one home per acre to one home per quarter acre. So I wasn't really worried about it until I'm watching this now. Um, we are current and we're adjacent to the city of Tarpon. When you say proponent, that sounds like we're for it. What we're for is being able to go into the city of Tarpon Springs or whatever, or a zoning variance where if we wanted to, it could be one home per acre, which we feel is very viable for that area. I'm not sure we're real clear. I'm a little nervous. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. So, so you would be, a, you're, you're against the action today. Yes, because that's um, fine. I, and that's I mean, what I, I got a little confused because my husband got called in on the proponent one. And like I said, we got the document in the mail and I wasn't really worried about it. Um, but we're against it because we like to be able to say we have that option. If they wanted to go in the city, they can figure it out. One home per acre, I do not feel does any harm to that area whatsoever. Um, and we have a beautiful piece of property um, and been there 35 years. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. I hope that makes sense. Yep, thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna go back to Miss Lindsay. Miss Lindsay, I'm gonna unmute, request you to unmute at this time. If you're having trouble unmuting and you're on your computer, if you hit the Alt-A key, that should allow you to unmute as well. Sarah, uh, let's go on with the, if we don't have any more proponents, let's go on to the opponents. And uh, again, we can try back with her in just a little bit. We just kind of keep the, keep it moving here. Sure. So any opponents wishing to speak at this time, please hit the raise hand button in Zoom, or if you're calling in on the phone, please dial star nine on the phone. I see no one else wishing to speak on this item. Okay. Um, well, go ahead. You want to try? You want to try Miss Lindsay again? Sure. I'll try Miss Lindsay again, and then we do have someone that just tried a phone number to call in. So Miss Lindsay will try you again. If you could unmute yourself. Oh, we also um, we have a phone caller. The last four digits of the phone are 9076. I'm going to allow you to talk and request you to unmute yourself. If you could please state your name, spell it, and your address, and then you have three minutes to speak. You should be able to unmute yourself at this time. The... Hello? Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Yes. Uh, my name is Chris Robosky, H-R-A-B-O-V-S-K-Y. Uh, I live at 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34689. I just wanted to add briefly that uh, Commissioner Donovan repeated several times that this annexation was done legally. That is, in fact, not true. And that is why it has been challenged in court. And it is going to be uh, adjudicated. 
before the end of the year, most likely. So it has not been done legally. The procedure was done improperly and is being challenged. And the legal definitions uh, throughout are wrong. So it would be totally, I mean, they even had an extra unprecedented meeting on this item in Tarpon. The city commission had to hold an extra meeting about it because they screwed it up so bad. So just for your information, those of you that don't know or haven't been following it, it is in court and it was not done properly. So I couldn't let that go. Thank you very much. And thank you for what you're doing. All right, anybody, if there's nobody else, we'll try Liz one more time. And we've tried her four, five, four or five times. Try one more time, see if we can get her um, to weigh in. And, and then we're gonna move on. You're muted, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lindsay, if you could state and spell your name and then your address, you have three minutes after that. And it looks like you're on mute. So if you could unmute yourself. And you appear to be unmuted. Liz, are you there? Yeah, turn your volume up. We can't hard, we can hear you, but very, very light now. So turn your volume up. Or if you could speak closer to your microphone, please. Well, we could hear you. Maybe you turned it down. Try one. Try the other direction. We're not. We're not hearing you, Liz. I, I'm sorry. We're gonna. We're gonna have to move on. I, we have tried several times now. Uh, any. Any last second success there, Sarah? No, she's unmuted. Um, so it's a matter of just, a, I think, the technology volume. Okay. There, there's nothing else we can do on our end. Um, if you'd like to call in, you could, Ms. Lindsay, call in. Um, the phone number is 312-626-6799. And then the webinar ID is 885-3247-7408. And then you would press star nine on the phone to raise your hand. You can also switch your audio in Zoom um, where you have the microphone. You could switch it from your computer speakers to phone audio and it would give you a phone number. And then you could use that as your audio as well. I hope she followed you, Sarah. It was crystal mud to me. So <laughs> not, not that you're, it was probably, if somebody knew what they're doing, uh, it was crystal clear, but for me, I didn't follow that. Um, all right. Um, again, I think we've, we've heard from the board. We've heard from the uh, folks. I, I need um, to go ahead and ask for a motion um, on this item, please. Move approval. Second. Okay. Okay, you got a motion and a second. Did you get that, Pina? No, I did not get the first or the second. Who made the motion? Garden Rice. Thank you. Second was Janet Long. I was going to say it was kind of a tie for the second, so we'll go with that. Thank you. Okay. And you Sarah, ready? I nothing else from the uh, from uh, Liz, so we'll go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote, please. Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Commissioner Donovan? No. Vice Mayor Sofer? Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Council Member Rice? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Yeah. Mayor Bradbury? Nay. Commissioner Long? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye, and um, I think that motion carried 10 to two, is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, 
thanks everybody for um, for weighing in on that uh, on that item. We're going to move on to uh, item 4B2, which is countywide uh, 2014. It's uh, regarding the Pinellas County request again for downtown Palm Harbor. Uh, Nasheen, again, you're uh, you're up. Thank you, Commissioner. Next case being presented is CW 20-14, also submitted by Pinellas County. The county seeks to amend properties from the activity center designation, retail and services, employment, office, public, semi-public, residential medium, and residential low medium categories, all to the activity center designation. And the purpose of the proposed amendment is to expand the existing downtown Palm Harbor neighborhood activity center. The amendment area is located in downtown Palm Harbor, Palm Harbor generally located east of H Street south of Pennsylvania Avenue, west of Omaha Street, and north of Wisconsin Avenue, with an area size of approximately 63.8 acres. Its existing uses include residential, retail, office, and automobile repair uses, with surrounding uses, including some residential and retail as well, along with some recreation open space plans. To provide context for this amendment area, it is part of the downtown Palm Harbor Master Plan, which was established in 2001 and updated on December 5, 2019. A key recommendation in this up update was the expansion of the existing activity center neighborhood designation. The county also intends to adopt the Palm Harbor form-based code zoning district, which is a new zoning district that will serve as a regulating plan for new developments in this area and is expected to be adopted by the Board of County Commissioners in the coming months. By expanding the existing neighborhood activity center, it is the intention of the county to provide a more holistic approach to planning for the greater downtown area and to plan for a transition between the downtown core that centers along Florida Avenue and the primarily residential neighborhoods adjacent to the boundaries of the proposed activity center. The two images in front of you show the building typology and development that is the goal of this area. The image on top shows that core downtown area I mentioned in the last slide. And the second image mentions those primarily or depicts those primarily residential neighborhoods. These next few images are to give you an idea of the type of uses within the amendment area. The following two images in front of you are retail and services uses located south and west of alternate US 19. The next two images are residential properties located east and north of Florida Avenue. And these last two images are some restaurant uses near 11th Street and Nebraska Avenue. The map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map categories, and I will also be listing the various permitted uses for these current categories, starting with the activity center designation and the retail and services category. Next, we have the employment and office categories, public, semi-public, and residential medium categories. And lastly, the permitted uses for the residential low medium category. These next few slides will show the permitted density and intensity standards for these current countywide map plan map categories, starting with activity center, but specifically for the neighborhood center subcategory, retail and services category, the employment category, density and intensity standards for the office category, public semi-public, residential medium, and lastly, residential low medium. This next map portrays the proposed countywide plan map category of the activity center designation, again, with its permitted uses listed, as well as its density and intensity standards. In context, the allowable residential densities for the various subcategories of the activity center designation range from 60 to 200 units per acre, while the intensity ranges from a floor area ratio of two to eight. Again, listed in front of you are just the density and intensity standards for the neighborhood center subcategory, as that is what it's appli is applicable to the proposed amendment. As you know, from the last presentation, one of the countywide considerations taken into account is the location of an amendment area on an SNCC, which this proposed amendment is found to be on with residential and mixed use classifications. However, the residential classification within the amendment area Shown, as shown on the map in front of you, is proposed to be changed to the mixed use classification. The mixed use classification is one that is compatible with the proposed activity center category. Another countywide consideration taken into account is the location of an amendment area within a coastal high hazard area or CHHA. 
as you can see from the map in front of you, a portion of the western part of the amendment area is located on a CHHA. However, most of these properties are already existing as single family residential homes, which are unlikely to develop into more intense uses, hence limiting the impact of the proposed amendment on the CHHA. Amendments to the activity center designation are required to address the planning and urban design principles as described in the countywide plan strategies. The following are examples of how the downtown Palm Harbor master plan and associated form based code zoning district address these principles. For example, the connectivity principle is addressed through downtown Palm Harbor's extensive gridded street network with walkable access to surrounding neighborhoods. Furthermore, the principal concern with the transition to neighborhoods is addressed through the form-based code, which helps distinguish the central core of the downtown from the primarily residential neighborhoods, as you saw from the first two images in this presentation. To wrap up, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the activity center category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section, section 6531 of the countywide plan rules. Listed in front of you is an analysis of those relevant countywide considerations. And lastly, there were some public comments received for this case. One resident expressed concerns regarding their property being split among two zoning districts. However, the district map was amended to include their property in one zoning district. Second, a resident reached out to staff expressing their favor for the proposed amendment, citing it as part of the original goal of the area. And lastly, a public comment was received for this case subsequent to the finalization of this presentation and board meeting agenda, but it was sent to you prior to this meeting for your consideration. The resident has inquired whether the downtown Palm Harbor master plan will involve title undertakings or third party acquisitions of private property. To address this inquiry, there is no intention of the master plan to do so. Therefore, I'm concluding my presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nasheen. Um, are there any questions of, from the board? Again, I'm assuming that uh, all the notifications went to everybody within the, uh, the expanded zone, right? Correct, both residents and business owners. Okay. And we had the three, three comments. That, that came in. Yes, we did receive um, a few more calls inquiring about the amendment, but they were in support once explained. Um, just real, just curious on the the uh, the crosshatched. Uh, that's County Road One, correct? Or um, I, I'm looking at a map that has a uh, the new the proposed countywide plan map, the new one, the blue. It's mm -hmm. all, all all blue, so everything. It, what, the rationale behind go, uh, in going to the east side of County Road 1, somebody could just speak to that. I believe county staff are on the line. They might be able to better answer that question. Okay. And it's it's not straight. It's kind of, I just was curious how they determined that to the east. If somebody is there, they could answer that, please. Yes, Scott is on the line. Yes, I don't know. Can you see me and hear me? I can hear I can you. I'm sorry? Can hear you. Okay, I guess that's good enough. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman Eggers. It's a good question. Uh, one of the reasons for the expansion to cover both sides of County Road One, um, from a planning perspective, it's often more beneficial that we have we're covering both properties on either side of a roadway because it really to to just treat one side of a roadway one way and the other side differently. Um, it doesn't really help in neighborhood building because you may have certain types of uses and a certain type of form and character on one side and the other side is different and that be kind of, can be kind of awkward. So okay. really kind of covering the entire stretch of Omaha um, was our intent. And then once you get um, beyond uh, the, the parcel depth of Omaha, and then we're starting to get into the more, uh, the more kind of residential established subdivisions and neighborhoods and then we we drop out of the activity center category yeah look i was looking at your those properties and they all look for the most part like one one property on the uh east side of omaha uh, except down below georgia avenue it looks like it has several parcels going back is that because it's three parcels but one owner or well so when we um created the map 
that was one piece of property. And is, it has actually come to my attention just last week that um, about 55 or 65 feet um, of depth from Omaha um, has been carved into an additional parcel. So we had, we had only intended to capture um, one parcel deep on Omaha, and we initially did, but since, um, since that map was created, and again, I just learned about this last week, um, that has now been split into two properties, and my understanding is that both properties still remain under the same ownership. Okay, and they, and they were given notification for this hearing as well? Yes, sir, as well as uh, the local planning agency meeting that was held on this already and the Board of County Commissioners public hearing. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? Okay, uh, Sarah, uh, see if there's any proponents or opponents. Sure, we'll first ask for proponents, then opponents, and then citizens to be heard. Any proponents wishing to address the board should raise their hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom or star nine on the phone. I do see we already have one proponent uh, wishing to speak, phone number ending 1330. Sarah, please... that is uh, Mr. Geddes Jr. who spoke previously. Thank you. As Mr. Geddes Jr., I will allow you to speak. Um, you'll have three minutes to speak and I'm gonna ask you to unmute you should be able to speak at this time. Hi, thank you. Um, the presenter was very difficult. Her enunciation was hard to understand during the presentation of the uh, um, describing uh, the downtown uh, Palm Harbor plan. Um, but to what I was intending on saying, um, discussing with, with my neighbors here and living in unincorporated Pinellas County, um, it makes it difficult to understand the incorporating of this master plan from a, a residential viewpoint here on the west side of alternate 19 um, in Palm Harbor. We wish to remain residential and we reject the mixed use facility development. Um, after reviewing the ordinance in support of the master plan form based code, uh, the, the, the plan seems to be voluminous and, and somewhat indescript. Um, especially as to where the funding of such mixed use facility uh, development is to be derived from, um, is the, uh, the future quality of our water and our roads first in place in order to patronize um, this increased density and land use. Um, does the, uh, the affected properties of this downtown master development plan have anything to do with third party uh, fee simples or uh, acquisitions, increase of easements, variances, um, with an underlying principle, an attempt to privatize the area um, as based on statute 15303 section five. Um, does this overlay plan of such involve any systematic step-by-step -step facility appropriations um, or tapping of title that may affect the equity that I, a, a resident, have compiled in my home? Um, the interest of this downtown plan seems to, uh, in the long run, be uh, appears to be convoluted. Um, and in my defense, I feel as though, based on statute 817.034, um, that from what I perceive as a scheme um, and an ongoing uh, course of conduct um, uh, and willful misrepresentation of, of, of this act, um, that uh, utilizing the, the you know legal precedents available today, um, I, I do believe we have some nefarious um, undertakings um, that are taking place within this plan uh, that's being presented before us regarding development practices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have no other or proponents wishing to speak on this. Any opponents? Any opponents wishing to speak to the board, please raise your hand at this time by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom or star nine if you're on the phone. I see no opponents. Any citizens wishing to be heard that would like to address the board, please raise your hand by pressing the raised hand button in Zoom or star nine if you're on the phone.
We have no other citizens wishing to be heard on this item. Okay. Um, maybe, Scott, are you still there? Yes, sir. Um, you know, again, using your, the logic that you used on Omaha, and we if we go to the west side of Alt-19, going down Florida Avenue, you have some commercial properties there. Um, and again, I, you know, the rash, just some of the rationale from uh, going beyond Florida to the south, uh, you know, residential on Georgia Avenue. And then I guess that's really it, because I think on north of Florida, it's pretty much commercial there. But maybe you could speak a little bit to Georgia Avenue itself and the, the thinking behind that area having um, being included in this, because it is a bunch of uh, residential homes down through there. Sure, no problem. Uh, it, the existing neighborhood activity center already includes um, a small area west of Alt 19. It's actually a by, um, it, it's, there are two separate areas in, that are a part of that activity center. Now there's, there's one unique area east of Alt 19 and then one west of Alt 19. And the one west of Alt 19 currently only includes Florida Avenue. Uh, during our stakeholder involvement, public outreach, um, participation, um, surveys, and whatnot, uh, the, some of the things that we are learning in updating the master plan is this desire to better connect um, east to west and west and vice versa, west to east. A lot of the um, recreation amenities um, like Pop Stanzel Park, very heavily used, really nice park, um, the Sunderland ball field complex, the water itself and the Pinellas Trail are all on the west side of Alt 19. And we heard lots of stories of, of people want, you know, they want to use, not only live in that area, but use those facilities and then make their way over across Alt 19 to the east side where the downtown core is located. So we ended up including that entire area in the activity center. Now through the, the implementation of the activity center, the actual land development regulations and standards, um, that west side of Alt 19 is primarily, um, and this and this comes out of the form based code, which is, which is a pending item that is scheduled to go to before the board next month. That sets the land use um, for that west side, and the land uses on that west side are primarily just you know they're residential, almost all in nature, with some civic allowances as well. Um, so there's really um, the benefit to having it on that west side is more in, um, you know, the predictability of form, design, character, uh, the kinds of things that will be respectful of and enhance that west side uh, neighborhood. And that's why we included that piece. And we really only went as far south as Georgia in doing that. We wanted to be able to um, include as many residents over there for that west side as possible um, to speak I believe, Commissioner Eggers, if you'd mentioned as far as on the east side going to the north and south of the downtown core? No, it was really more on the west side, okay. just the west side, Georgia Avenue, um, you know, the, 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 just some of the rationale. But you're saying that it's going to be uh, primarily stays as residential along Georgia Avenue. Yes, sir. Okay. That's the land, that'll be the land use category there. The the land use category is neighborhood activity center, and then the zoning is calibrated to allow primarily just residential uses across the board on that west side. And actually, Georgia today is permitted uh, with single family, uh, duplex, uh, triplex, you know, more than just single family units today. Gotcha. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. My pleasure. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's uh, need a motion for this, please. I'll make the motion, Susie Sofer. Second, Second. Senate Long. Okay. okay, let's do the roll call, please. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Bissinger. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Council Member Rice. Yes. Commissioner Welch. Aye. Commissioner Seal. Yeah. Mayor Bradbury. 
aye. Commissioner Long. Yes. Commissioner <clears throat> Eggers. Uh, I and the motion carries unanimously. Um, and we're going to move on to item uh, three. Just before we get started on that, I just wanted to give a heads up. I think item 5G, uh, we're going to have a few people that want to speak at that. So I'm going to um, respectfully ask to move 5G up to the first presentation once we're finished with this final um, uh, Pinellas Planning Council action. So um, just give everybody a heads up. Uh, Todd, if you're out there, we're going to move you up a little bit here, but we're going through another uh, another countywide plan amendment uh, action for City of Largo. Go ahead, Nishin. Thank you. Thank you. Next case being presented is CW 20-15, submitted by the City of Largo. The city seeks to amend a property from the public semi-public category to the retail and services category. And the purpose of the proposed amendment is to allow for the development of retail commercial uses. The subject property is located on 4825 East Bay Drive with an area size of approximately 4.36 acres. It is currently used as a church owned property with surrounding uses, including residential and other commercial uses. The following is an image of the front of the subject property. Next, an image of retail and services uses existing north of the subject property. Next, East Bay Drive facing east of the subject property. Similarly, East Bay Drive facing west of the subject property. And lastly, an image of the residential neighborhood located south of the subject property. The following map portrays the current countywide plan map category of public semi-public with its permitted uses and density and intensity standards listed in front of you. It is the intent of the owner to develop retail commercial uses on this property, which is not a permitted use under the public semi-public category, hence the proposed amendment to retail and services. This map shows the proposed category of retail and services along with its permitted uses listed in front of you. And the next slide shows the allowable density and intensity standards of this category. It should be noted that while the applicant does intend to develop retail commercial uses, a development agreement between the applicant and the city restricts the owner um, to uses with a lower density than is allowable by right through the retail and services category in order to reduce the impacts to the residential neighborhood to the south of the, prop of the subject property, as I showed you in the image previously. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate, appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the retail and services category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Again, in front of you are, is an analysis of those relevant countywide considerations I mentioned before. And lastly, there were no public comments for KCW 20-15 concluding this presentation. Thank you, Nasheen, for that uh, presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions for staff? I don't I don't see any. We hands have waiting. Commissioner Sofer, or Vice Mayor Sofer. Sorry Is about that. Right? Thank you, Go Mr. Ahead. Chair. I just wanted to thank Nasheen for her presentations on all of these. Um, um, I know they're not fun to do, and uh, I found them very clear and concise. So I just wanted to personally thank her for putting the presentation together for us. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's very much a team well, effort, so I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, well said. Thank you for, for making that comment. Anybody else from the board? I don't see, Sarah, can you see anybody from the board? I can't see anybody else from the board. I see no other board members with their hands raised. I see uh, Brian Onkst is on the line. Is, um, is Are we gonna go, go to proponents first? Is that the idea? Yes, so please. at this time, if there are any proponents wishing to address the board, please raise your hand by using the raise hand button in Zoom or pressing star nine on the phone if you're calling in. We do have one um, proponent at this time, Brian Onkst, I'm gonna allow you to speak. Please state and spell your name and then your address, and then you'll have three minutes. I'm allowing you to speak now and asking you to unmute. So you should be able to speak at this time. Good afternoon, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, this is Brian Angst. Last name is A-U-N-G-S-T. I'm joined with uh, Robert Pergolese, uh, Brad Carnes, and Carmine Lacagnata. 
and we are at 625 Court Street, Clearwater, 33756. Thank you, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, I wanna thank uh, the Largo City staff and City Commission, uh, Director Strickland and Rick Perez um, and Alicia. We've been working with um, the Largo planning staff for about a year now. Um, the project is currently under a development agreement, which significantly reduces uh, any kind of problematic uses to make sure they are consistent with the uh, adjoining residential uses. Uh, and no other properties that have the retail and services designation in that area are under similar restrictions. Uh, but my client wanted to do that to make sure that this would be uh, absolutely consistent uh, with the, uh, the amendment that's being requested. And we also changed the request from a commercial general uh, future land use amendment uh, designation under the Largo code to a retail office residential, uh, which has a much lower FAR it's all retail and services from a countywide perspective, but I did want to just make sure that the Ford Pinellas board members were aware that we've gone through extensive and collaborative work with the city of Largo. We greatly appreciate all of their work to help us get to this point. Um, and we do believe it's a great project that is consistent with, um, with all of the countywide considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that, uh, those comments. Uh, anybody else, Sarah? I see no other proponents wishing to address the board. Okay. If there are any opponents wishing to address the board, please raise your hand at this time by using the raise hand button in Zoom or star nine on the phone. I see no opponents. If there are any citizens wishing to be heard to address the board at this time, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom or star nine on the phone. I see no one else wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, ask for a motion on this, please. So move. Approval. I have a motion, um, Commissioner Welch. Who was the second? Was that Council Member Albritton? Second. Okay. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer? Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Mayor Kennedy, you're on mute. Excuse me, yes. Council Member Rice? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Seal? Yeah. Mayor Bradbury? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Eggers? Aye, and that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Nasheen, for those presentations. Uh, we're going to move down, as I said a minute ago, down to the US 19 North uh, planned pedestrian underpass. Uh, Whit, uh, if you'll go ahead, you had, a, you had a few comments, and then I know there's a couple people who wanted to, to express their comments to us as well. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, are you going to advance my slides for me? I can't hear you. Oh, I apologize. I can unless you want to request screen sharing and then you could do it yourself. It's Let me go to... ahead and just do it. I think that's probably easiest. Okay. Well, thank you, board members. I, I do have a brief presentation here that I want to give um, primarily just to um, uh, give some context uh, to this uh, proposal. And Sarah, it's still not letting me. So why don't you just advance the slides for me? If you could move to the next slide, please. Sure. Okay, I just wanted to outline the issue. The Florida Department of Transportation is currently in, late in the design phase for US 19 from State Road 580 to County Road 95. This is the Curly Road interchange. It also will remove a traffic signal that exists currently at Republic Drive to create an overpass at that location. Uh, this is consistent with the longstanding strategy of, of the MPO and FDOT to upgrade US-19 as a partially controlled access facility. Funding for construction of this project is scheduled currently in FY22. 
Uh, the design uh, includes uh, pedestrian and bicycle crossings, either underpasses or an overpass uh, every quarter, every half mile, uh, consistent with the recommendation by the Ford Pinellas Board. The um, issue here today is that uh, there is a pedestrian throughway, an underpass, about 450 feet south of Republic Drive that some adjacent business owners uh, have uh, raised as a concern because the additional elevation of the roadway to accommodate the throughway um, is, is perceived as diminishing the visibility of their businesses. And they've also raised the issue that um, uh, a one day count out there showed that fewer than 10 people were crossing at the Republic Drive location. So they contend that it's not needed. Next slide, please. This is um, um, a little bit of background. The city of Clearwater uh, since 2011, at least, uh, has been working on a redevelopment strategy for the US 19 quarter. Uh, on the image on the bottom right of your screen, you can see that uh, the Curlew Neighborhood Center is on the left side of the screen, all the way down to Bel Air Neighborhood Center on the right hand side of the screen. So the city has long intended to uh, recognize the redevelopment potential of US 19 for mixed use redevelopment, uh, a transit friendly environment, uh, and to encourage higher wage employment. Uh, notably in their US 19 quarter redevelopment plan, they completed a market study to look at the demand for different land uses along this corridor. And the goal here has always been to provide a safe, attractive and accessible setting for people to live, work and shop. Next slide, please. I would just want to highlight some of the market analysis findings because in addition to the city of Clearwater study back in 2011, uh, Ford Pinellas authorized additional market research studies completed uh, in 2017 uh, in, the city, in unincorporated county in Palm Harbor, in the city of Clearwater, Tarpon, and Largo. And in general, those market studies found that there was high demand uh, for a variety of different retail, uh, um, residential offerings, I'm sorry, uh, and that the demand for high wage employment was likely to be limited because of the relatively small parcel size. Um, and so the leading investment in the quarter is likely to be residential, not high end employment based on that market study. I will note that um, three years or even eight years is kind of a long time ago and things have changed. So the county is planning to do an updated market study of this quarter uh, within the next year is my understanding. Uh, but this is the best information that we have in the most recent, and it shows that residential demand is strong. And if you look at the US 19 corridor in general, it provides a lot of regional accessibility. And the Pinellas Park area in particular, as well as Clearwater, are seeing a lot of additional uh, residential development. I believe there's also some additional residential development happening in the Largo portion of the corridor. So um, there's certainly current market conditions illustrating that demand. Next slide, please. So from a safety and network planning consideration, I wanted to just walk you through um, a little bit of history and context. Next slide, please. The um, US 19 quarter, Sarah, if you could advance, there you go, uh, has been under development for a couple of decades at least. Uh, and the image on the right just shows that we've completed these grade separations south. Uh, they have in some cases um, negatively influenced adjacent businesses because of the lack of access and the lack of visibility. And as we go forward, we wanted to make sure in our spotlight emphasis uh, initiative that we considered both land use and transportation together and had a clear vision for what we anticipate for US 19. The maps on the left um, just show the different projects that are in the pipeline uh, for DOT to complete that uh, grade separation of the partially controlled expressway. Uh, the one we're dealing with now is to the south of this map, and then the others will uh, proceed as funding becomes available. Next slide, please. Um, take you back a couple of years to the Harn Boulevard overpass issue. Uh, Harn Boulevard is just south of uh, Gulf to Bay, a little bit south of Gulf to Bay. And when the overpass went in, it created a barrier uh, where previously there was an access a traffic signal at Harn Boulevard at US 19 and it created a barrier that limited access uh, east and west uh, between residential and non-residential parcels. People were um, taking uh, whatever means they could to cross US 19 on foot, um, a lot to their detriment. So we've had a number of crashes and fatalities. This is a safety project 
that is now funded by the Department of Transportation, uh, totally to the tune of about $8 million, including design and construction. And that construction is funded in, the, in FY21, so the current fiscal year. And uh, we've been advocating for this for a number of years, um, basically to address um, the omission of, of thinking about this back in the day when this section was designed. Next slide, please. So as a result of the Harn Boulevard discussions and the anticipation of additional construction to the north, uh, the advisory committees of, of Ford Pinellas and our board on May 2018 voted to um, direct the Florida Department of Transportation to work to accommodate pedestrian crossings every quarter mile uh, as the design proceeds north of the Pasco County line. As I mentioned, the department was unable to accommodate quarter mile crossing, but they have worked to carry out that goal and have proposed about a half mile crossing for each of these uh, locations. And I say pedestrian crossing, it could be for bicyclists, pedestrians, wheelchair users, and um, just looking at the graphic, um, which I've shared with you previously on State Road 580 or Main Street on the left side, Curlew is on the right side this time. The pedestrian throughway is about 0.47 miles north of State Road 580, so about a half a mile. The U-turn overpass uh, is at Boy Scout Boulevard, and that would also be a, an accommodation for east-west pedestrian crossing. At Northside Drive, about four-tenths of a mile north of Boy Scout is an overpass that's planned that would tie in to the Duke Energy Trail at some point. And then Curly Road, about five, uh, a little more than half a mile, will be a full interchange like you see at State Road 580 or at Sunset Point or the other interchanges. Uh, the department has advised me that the approximate cost is just a little over a million dollars for this pedestrian throughway. Again, the total project budget is I don't have the exact number handy, but it's uh, between 80 and $100 million. And um, the reason we asked the department to adjust uh, the overpass, and I don't believe that's on the next slide. Um, let's see. Yep. Um, we asked them to see if they could move that throughway uh, to accommodate the adjacent businesses' concerns, either to the south or to the north. And unfortunately, they're not able to do that because of geometric constraints. There's the proximity to the State Road 580 overpass. And then there is the ramps that merge um, to the frontage roads, either getting off on the frontage road or getting from the frontage road to US 19 that need to be accommodated. And so we're, we're either left with uh, having the throughway at this location or not having a throughway at all until you get to uh, Boy Scout Boulevard. Next slide, please. And uh, the department provided some video animations to the property owners, and I've shared these with you at our last meeting. I'm not gonna go into the video animations in the interest of time, but this is a screen capture of what that looks like. And you can see this is, um, right now, it's kind of a plain vanilla design. We could certainly look at um, art or architectural enhancements. Uh, and we've talked to the department a little bit about that. But uh, what's really nice about this is that you can see the sidewalk is being widened to 10 feet um, over there. Um, they're gonna try and accommodate 10 feet throughout. And then you've got a nice wide crossing, highly visible. That's protected with uh, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons that a pedestrian would push to alert approaching motorists that they are crossing and in the crosswalk. Next slide, please. And these are links, they're in the PowerPoint presentation. If you wanted to watch the video animations, uh, they show the main line, US 19 and the frontage roads, both north and south. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to make the point that when we plan for infrastructure, we do plan for at least 30 years and uh, we can't anticipate what changes will happen in every location. So I just wanted to walk you through here. Next slide, please. Uh, we did, um, I think a very conservative analysis um, of both existing and potential future population in this area. And uh, the geographic information system analysis used property appraiser, parcel, and building data. Uh, we recognize it's not 100% accurate, but it's, it's got a lot of reliability. And we drew a half mile walk shed, basically a comfortable 10 minute walk uh, is about the outer limit of what people generally feel comfortable in, in, in our weather um, to see what we could capture. And based on that analysis, we estimate, and I wanna clarify, it's an estimate about 
1,700 residents permanently live within that half mile walkshed of the pedestrian underpass. There was a national database that shows a fewer uh, number of people uh, completed by ESRI, but again, that's not local data. And um, I, I trust our local data more than national data. Next slide, please. What's telling about those 1,700 uh, permanent residents is that there is a relatively high proportion of the population uh, that have no vehicles available. And you can see where I've drawn yellow circles around where the throughway would be located. Uh, and that's kind of characteristic up and down US 19, where generally speaking, um, they're not high affluent uh, areas. Um, they are people who tend to be more transit dependent, more transportation disadvantaged, uh, and generally lower income. And you can see on the right that uh, in this particular area, a higher percentage of the population is below the poverty level uh, and a higher percentage of minority population. A lot of these are mobile home parks in this area. Next slide. So the next step was to look at the future uh, land use and to see what would be allowed without any land use changes. And we've just had a long discussion of land use changes. Those aren't necessarily easy to do. Um, so people could come in today and propose land use changes on some of these parcels and not go through that arduous process. And we could be uh, seeing as many as 4,500 more people and an additional 2,500 residential units. We did this with a mind to being very conservative. Uh, so we only picked a handful of select parcels that we think are susceptible to change. Next slide, please. Uh, so those are shown on the map. And what's interesting, if you look at the zoning, uh, all of the zoning categories along this section allow residential uh, by right, whether it's retail office residential and it's a mixed use category or residential low medium. If, if the market wants to support residential, there are numerous ways to do that here. The parcels that we picked that could possibly change were small retail strip uh, shopping plazas. Uh, we've seen a lot of those transition, single owner mobile home parks and freestanding retail buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, parcels, we only considered parcels that were immediately adjacent to 19. So there potentially are other parcels that could change outside of that proximity. And then remaining parcels um, uh, also have allowable residential development. Next slide, please. What we did not include in this analysis of the additional 4,500 people are things like preservation and stormwater, uh, public utilities, recent commercial investment, larger chain retail, uh, anything that requires a future land use map amendment or multi-story office buildings. These have proven to be pretty stable over time. Next slide. Um, and again, looking at that 30 year outlook, uh, let's talk about safety and network planning. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is a section of US-19 that has an inordinate share of crashes. Uh, it is the uh, Tampa and Curley Road, which is a little further north, uh, have, are the number one and number two crash locations in Pinellas County. Between Curlew and 580, we had 2,100 crashes over a five-year period uh, dating back to about 2015, um, including some pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcycles, 11 fatalities along the section. And again, just following that Harn Boulevard example, and we had another project on US-19 recently approved down in the Pinellas Park area where DOT is building a median barrier to prevent people from crossing where they're not supposed to. So there's ample evidence of people crossing where they need to. Next slide, please. We worked with PSTA to get ridership data on this section and historically Route 19 has been the highest ridership route in PSTA system. Several years ago, about three years ago, I believe they converted that route into two different routes so the higher ridership is south of uh, downtown or, or the Clearwater Gulf to Bay intersection to the south. Uh, but still this uh, ridership is, is still pretty good in the overall system. At this location of the pedestrian throughway, we had an average of 73 weekday boardings and 77 daily boardings on an average day uh, in the weekend. Um, and there is a major PSTA transfer hub at Main Street and Somerdale Drive, just on the north side of the Countryside Mall which is also within that half mile walk shed of this pedestrian throughway. Um, a reminder that when we adopted the Advantage Pinellas Long Range Transportation Plan last November, 
we identified several investment corridors in the county where we would work over time to develop a higher frequency um, express bus or bus rapid transit type transit connection in these corridors. And we dubbed those Advantage Pinellas investment corridors because we recognized that they were a connection between residential areas and job training. Uh, transit was viable in these corridors and we saw a lot of potential for redevelopment. The countywide land use, um, countywide plan uh, land use um, rules were amended to enable higher density development to occur within these investment corridors throughout the county. Next slide, please. Oh, and, and Sarah, I'm sorry, go back, please. If you just look at this transit shelter there, that's where this pedestrian throughway would go. And you can see the very skinny sidewalk uh, that's there and the frontage road with that bike lane next to what's a pretty high speed road. Uh, the department is conducting um, a retrofit analysis of the frontage roads. They'll be wrapping that work up this fall. And while that doesn't cover all the way to this location, uh, they are taking the um, analysis further to the south and hoping to not only retrofit those sections, but apply those lessons learned and observations to the sections to the north. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of our countywide trail network, um, I'm compelled to point out that uh, construction is underway for the Duke Energy Trail uh, just to the east of that red star where you see the pedestrian throughway is located. And that will be the segment um, from Enterprise Road to um, uh, Chestnut Park. And that is, uh, while there's still some alignment details to work out, uh, we know that that is being constructed today at least to Northside Drive. Um, and that is uh, at the northern end of the, th of the throughway. Um, in addition, that will create a 75 mile trail network around the county. It will also connect to the Coast to Coast Trail, a 250 mile connection all the way across to the city of Titusville and Brevard County. And what we've seen is as we close these gaps and as we provide greater connectivity, trail usage dramatically increases. And over the last six months, we've seen a virtual doubling of trail ridership and usage, I should say, particularly in the Dunedin and Palm Harbor areas, but we've seen increases throughout the trail. Um, and um, one of the other challenges that we find with the trail is that it's great to have the loop, but many, many Pinellas, Pinellas residents who use it don't live right on the trail. And so they have to travel one to three miles to get to a trail. And there are a lot of east-west gaps where we don't have any real connectivity. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna try and illustrate that a little bit. And we pulled a, um, a document from the city of Dunedin in 2011. This was a trail network plan or a, a bicycle pedestrian network plan that the city adopted. And what it shows is an east-west trail connection um, and, and I, forgive me, it might not be a trail, it might be a wide sidewalk or a, a bike lane, but Salon Avenue was intended to be an east-west connection between at least Belcher and the trail to the west, connecting via Patricia in Michigan. Uh, my understanding from city staff is that's still a desire, uh, but they did not have funding at the time to complete this particular segment. Next slide, please. The city has won a $40,000 grant for a citywide multimodal transportation plan, and they will be looking at that again. So I put together this map that just shows the potential connections to where the throughway is, which is now denoted as a dot. I'm sorry, I went away from the star. Um, and you can see the Salon Avenue connection on the left in dashed green. And I've boxed an area where potential connections could be made uh, to this pedestrian throughway to make it more valuable over time. Uh, so for instance, that could use uh, Republic Drive today, it could use Evans Road, it could use uh, Wilshire Drive, there's another potential connection there. And then to the east, uh, there's a possibility that that connect uh, into those residential areas that exist east of this box area. The blue up and down line shows the trail alignment uh, for the Duke Energy Trail that's currently under construction. Uh, and then I'll point out Northside Drive where we have an overpass. Today, there's no facility east of that overpass, uh, but uh, there's plenty of right of way out there to accommodate a wider sidewalk and a safe uh, option for people to get to the trail along Northside Drive. And while that may not be funded, just like Salon Avenue isn't today, um, the local governments could work with Ford Pinellas and we could work with the department 
uh, to find funds to make those connections, either through our transportation alternatives program or another type of funding source. Next slide, please. So the uh, staff recommendation that we've presented to our advisory committees and to the PSTA board and their transit riders advisory committee uh, was to go back uh, and ask the board to reinforce its quarter mile to half mile spacing goal for US 19 that you adopted in May of 2018 to support the inclusion of the pedestrian throughway south of Republic Drive uh, for US 19 for this section that's soon to be under construction uh, and further to support the safety and multimodal accessibility improvements along the frontage roads, because that's key to this as well, being successful. And finally, supporting any key east-west gaps uh, and closing those over time for the bicycle and pedestrian travel to make that network more complete. And the Druid Road Trail that was just opened a little over a year ago was a real landmark in closing some of that east-west connectivity south of Gulf Bay. So I think we've, we've started making real good progress on that and I would hate to see us skip a big chunk of, of the area for that. Um, so that is my presentation. I'm happy to entertain any questions, but I also wanted to give an opportunity to invite the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, I'm not sure if we still have Secretary Gwynn uh, or Justin Hall to maybe make a couple of brief remarks on this since it's their design project. Hey, Witt, I, I would just, um, Reinforced. You know, we've spent a lot of time working together with you and staff to, to look at options, and so we fully support the, the recommendation that you have, but we're certainly uh, willing to, to move forward with whatever the determination is. So thank you. Hey, uh, Whit, it's, it's Dave. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, in that area there for, for businesses, how high are they allowed to have their signs for their business, do you know? Um, I don't know if I know exactly how high, but we um, looked into that this morning, anticipating that question. And it appears that uh, the Pinellas County ordinance would allow for um, a, a modification to allow for a bigger and higher sign uh, in there. I don't know if Rodney's still here. I don't have my email open, but he sent me an email to that effect. We uh, Councilmember All Britain, you had a comment. You're muted, by the way. Yeah, I checked into that with City of Clearwater, um, and they are allow They did send me the ordinance allowing the businesses there to um, raise their signage. That's already in the uh, ordinances. Okay. And I will point out that the pedestrian throughway is. Um, going to increase the elevation about 12 feet and the department can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's my understanding. There'll be about a 10 foot clearance for uh, anybody traveling underneath, but the overall elevation is only being raised about 12 feet compared to almost 30 feet for a full interchange. Okay. Um, yeah, any, any, any other questions for WIT um, from, the, from the board? And the, and the frontage road is going to be widened there as well. So you're going to have a lot of activity uh, as people are driving towards 580 um, off of that, off of 19. The design includes the frontage roads and the mainline US 19, correct? So for instance, the wider sidewalk, uh, the department has been working hard to avoid a lot of right-of-way takes in that area. Um, so I don't think they're going to be encroaching into the right-of-way in any substantial manner there. Um, but yes, you'll see a wider sidewalk and the frontage roads, uh, my recollection of the frontage roads is that they'll be, um, they're working hard to maintain a 30 to 35 mile an hour speed limit, but that's not the case today. So they'll generally be about 11 feet uh, in, in width. Yeah, I like the idea of the every half mile at the most for sure. And I know that Witt and I talked and I know the FDOT looked at moving that a little further north to Republic Drive. You mentioned that already, Whit, but I think it's really important to note that that we were thinking of different ways to try to accommodate. FDOT actually went and did some design work just to see if it would work, and it just it just couldn't work there. And so now it's back to its original place, which again, I don't think the hump, it's not the 30-foot hump that 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 you would normally see. It's a much lower hump. You do have a, a ability to have taller signs. You do have the frontage road. Uh, access through there. Um, again, I, you know, I think we're all very sensitive and pro uh, 
uh, business support where we can. I, I think this is a this is a long term investment, and it's going to accommodate. I think Wit touched Wit touched on a lot of those items uh, that are coming in the next year, five years, ten years, could be twenty years. Uh, but the road that's built there will be there for quite some time. Mr. Chairman, any I'd other like comments? Okay. I'd like to also just point out our advisory committees, um, the Bicycle Pedestrian, the Citizens Advisory Committee, and the Technical Transportation Coordinating Committee uh, all voted unanimously um, to support the staff recommendation. Uh, notably, uh, Gloria Lepic Corrigan uh, is on our Citizens Advisory Committee. She's also on the PSTA Transit Riders Advisory Committee, and she is a wheelchair user. Uh, she uses the Republic Drive intersection today and describes how unsafe and uncomfortable it is to use. Um, and she is a regular transit rider. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that we should um, pay attention to uh, a handful of people today when we think that the demand will grow as we have better facilities out there. Well, I, 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 you know, I appreciate your, your, your thought. Um, you know, again, I think we do, uh, we do appreciate hearing from everybody. We do appreciate perspective, uh, but at, this, at the end of the day, I mean, there, there are other issues to look at. Um, any, um, uh, uh, since I'm not seeing any other comments from the board, um, Sarah, do we have anybody that's online? Anyone wishing to speak on this item, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom, or if you're on the phone, hit star nine. We do have a number of people who raise their hand wishing to speak. We'll call on you in the order that you raise their hand. So first is Karen Mullins, followed by Gloria Levick Corgan. Karen, please state your name. Um, I believe we already have it from the CAC, but if you could also provide your information and then you'll have three minutes. You should be able to speak now. Karen? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, yeah, Karen? we can. Um, CAC Dunedin, Florida. Um, I just want to make mention that the conversations that we had as the CAC met um, were that the folks that were complaining about this being in that area were car centric. We have so many people that would utilize this. We, to go a half mile, a mile out of the way is just too much to ask somebody who's walking in Florida please consider that the car centric businesses that are in that area may do better with walking people. They're saying, oh, look, there's a car. Maybe I can get a car. So please take that in consideration. Um, we really need this walkway and we'd like to continue with uh, complete streets. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Next. Next, we have Gloria Lepic Corgan. Gloria, I'm going to allow you to speak and unmute you. If you could please state, spell your name and address, and then you have three minutes. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Gloria Lepic Corrigan, and uh, I, I think you have the spelling of my name from other things, but um, I live at 2595 Countryside Boulevard. So I live in that area. And as you know, I'm calling in strong support of the recommendation for having the pedestrian crosswalks every half mile, first and foremost, and then very specifically the one here that is we're talking about south of Republic Drive. Um, again, as you know, I am a transit rider. I happen to be in a wheelchair. Um, I spend a lot of time on the sidewalks throughout the county, I, and I take buses to a lot of different locations. And one thing that people really often forget is that when you're taking a bus, Wherever you take it to, you're going to have to cross that road to get to the other side to go back home again. And so when it's a US 19 bus, uh, people need to try to get across. And so at every half mile, you at least have to give people that opportunity. Um, I really believe that the goal of this whole program is to provide safe movement for all our citizens, including those of us who are choosing to or cannot drive a car. Um, and I just think that this is a, an important part of smart planning for everyone, not just the car drivers. Um, it will save lives and it will save money in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gloria. 
Next, we have Press Inc. If you could please state and spell your name and give your address. And then after that, you will have three minutes to speak. I'm allowing you to speak right now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Todd Pressman, 200 Second Avenue South in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, number 451. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and board members, um, I'm representing um, a number of the businesses that have had long-term history right at this location. And what you're applying is basically a blanket policy, which is a blind policy along a roadway taking nothing into account other than distances. What you haven't been told and what I reported to you in the past is that FDOT did do a demand study at the dedicated crosswalk and traffic light for 12 hours. And they ended up having five people walking one direction and six people back in the other direction. I assume those are the same people. So at this site, there is no demand. You've heard from the businesses who have resided or been here for many years and decades to tell you that no one is ever crossing. They never see anyone crossing. They never really see anybody walking and looking to go across the street. So again, this is a governmental policy that we've placed on a roadway, which we are using no matter what the demand is. Now, when you look at Hart and Mr. and Witt had, a, had 20 minutes to go through this with a lot of nice PowerPoints. Everyone who knows me knows I like to use PowerPoints too. But the fact is the zoning along this route is all CP, commercial parkway. That's a commercial zoning. When you look at Harn, which Witt uses an example over and over again, there is tremendous multifamily fronting right on US 19. There's no comparison between that location and this location. I'm sure there's great demand at Harn because all you have to do is pull up an aerial and see the multitude of multifamilies there. Safety is very well contained. FDOT does it everywhere at all their freeways and all their high traffic roads, they erect large fences so people will not cross. The result here is that we are going to have a negative impact on these businesses that they have been here a long time, both in visibility and also in traffic control with different lanes and very secluded restricted lanes on either side of the expressway. So what we also didn't indicate to you, he keeps referring to Boy Scout as the crossing. Main Street is directly to the south. That's a shorter distance, is a very uh, well-protected pedestrian crossway with traffic lights and an overpass of US-19. That would be very fitting and it's there. It wouldn't cost the taxpayers a million dollars. And we all know when the government says a million dollars, it's gonna be much more than a million dollars. So in summary, don't create a public edifice that does not have demand. Safety can be insured. And the examples that have been thrown, given out to you are not qualified examples. We have a definitive indication of what demand is here, and we need to balance that need along with the business need. I appreciate your attention and communication. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. We have one more attendee with their hand raised, Duncan Kay. I'm going to allow you to speak. Please state and spell your name and address, and then you will have three minutes. I'm allowing you to speak now. Hey, thank you. This is Duncan Kovar. You guys know me. Uh, I sit with the Tampa Bay Post Carbon Council. I'm the chair of the uh, track PSTA track. I'm also on the CAC, the uh, Citizen Advisory for Forward Pinellas. It's KOV as in Victor AR. I live at 305 Los Prados Drive in Safety Harbor. From all those groups, this was my third chance to talk on WIT's presentation, and I'm very, very in favor of it as a transit user, as a transit advocate for those who are forced to take tra transit for their health because of economic reasons, cars are costing more and more, um, and because uh, traffic is just crazy in this town. Um, what I really wanna say is that the, this represents the future. What, what um, Witt is showing us with those potential changes, or shall we say likely changes up there in the North County, we see high density going in down at Harn. Uh, that wasn't there before, those new apartment blocks, those apartmageddon, uh, that kind of stuff is very likely to go in as soon as those hurricane uh, 
uh, un these old, old buildings, uh, strip malls up there being uh, torn down and put in with high density as soon as they can. Why are those all going to be car centric? We know that the prior generation, the, the young generation does not live like their parents. Matter of fact, opponents to this kind of stuff are really looking at yesterday, yesterday's world, yesterday's vision, cheap gas, cheap cars, gated communities. And what we're really trying to do is have a solution that's looking 30 years in the future. What do the kids want? What do our kids want? They want walkable communities. They want bikes. They want to go back to what we used to have, neighborhoods. And so um, what frustrates me is that US-19 is like a billion dollars has been sent on that, certainly since I moved here. And 99.99% of that money has gone to cars, cars that leave our town. They are racing out of town to Pasco County. And the only thing they leave behind are fumes and accidents. Um, we're trying to spend like 0.01 of that money for pedestrians that live here, people on bicycles. Are there nobody crossing that street? I can't imagine why. It's nine lanes long. You'd take your life into your own hands, especially if you're a wheelchair bound. Um, there's no reason to be doing that. Let's if you build it, they'll come. We know from the world, all around the world, that underpasses like this. By the way, an overpass like Harn is such a slap and dash afterthought. Are you going to be buying groceries? Is that why you took the bus? When you come back home, you have to haul them up a flight of stairs, haul them across nine lanes, and haul them back down. Are you on a bicycle? You got to ride it up a ramp. Are you pushing a baby carriage? Are you doing it in the boiling hot August sun? Are you doing it in a downpour? Is that how we treat our pedestrians? The point of killing this underpass isn't to um, say, oh, we're saving a million dollars against a billion dollars. It's to say, is to just say transit doesn't matter. Poor people don't matter. Uh, handicapped people don't matter. Let's just kill transit. If you don't have a car, hey, anyone with a car doesn't need it. 99.99% of people have cars. If you don't have a car, you're nobody in this town. And that's what that attitude says. Why don't we shut all of the underpasses? And if you go to one of those businesses, you have to drive down to Tarpon Road to turn around and just Excuse put 100. Me, your, your three minutes are up. You get the point. Uh, I let's please. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Any uh, Sarah? Any other uh, callers? No, we have no one, other attendees with their hand raised. Um, then I, what I guess what I'd be looking at is on page twenty-five. There's four staff recommendations um, that uh, Wit is asking us to uh, reaffirm at this point, and I'm sure it won't be the last time that we see these because as we continue to evolve and, and, and look at things, we have to kind of keep going back to some of these and just making sure that we're all still on the same page. So four staff recommendations, if we have somebody who wants to make a motion to that, I would appreciate it. I'll make the motion, Susie Sofer. I would second it with some comments. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, got a motion and a second, uh, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention that um, I've chaired two U.S. 19 task force, one in 2000 and one in 2006. And the one in 2006 was on pedestrian safety because we had quite a few deaths back then. So here it is um, 14 years plus later, and we're finally doing something about it. Um, and I think it is critically important to the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Seal. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, Mayor Bradbury. Thank you. Um, I, I do agree. Traveling US 19 um, northbound from Pinellas Park on a daily basis until FDOT put in the extension of the divider wall Almost daily, I would see people trying to cross from one side of US 19 going east to west or go, coming west to east, just running across it, which just, you know, you go like this, you know, in hopes that they're doing it smartly. Um, we do need crossings across there, um, but we also need to be mindful of whether it's a business or um, homes that uh, we need to 
when they were talking about the signs, you know, allow those businesses to flourish. That, you know, that they pay, you know, our taxes, they create our jobs. Um, I have seen when we've put in these overpasses, um, well, way too many of them just shutting down that have been around forever. Um, so, uh, but uh, kudos on getting these connections from one side of US 19 to the other for um, our pedestrians and for the people that just want to get out in the fresh air. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Thank Mayor Bujalski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I do appreciate what the uh, local businesses have to say and the, their communication about it. But I also think that as elected leaders, it's it's our job to think about the future and to think about what's going to happen in the future, what's likely to happen in the future. And I think public safety is probably our most important mission when we're making a vote. So um, knowing what could happen in the future and, and I can, it, it, really tells us how we should vote. I can be an advocate for that when I look at downtown Dunedin and where it was in the 1980s and where it is today. It is a completely different place. And so um, I do believe that transformation can and will happen. Um, to what degree, nobody will know, but we have to plan for that and we have to plan for public safety. So I think it's a critical yes vote for me. Thank you. Council member Al Britton. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to mention that uh, PSTA board unanimously uh, backs this uh, project for the safety of its ridership and also for the future of the ridership. Uh, as we expand up um, uh, US 19, it's very important to be able to have our ridership cross the street, you know, to get to our bus stops. Thank you. David, anybody, anybody else? I'm not seeing any hands, uh, the hand raise thing, but I can't see everybody. So um, having seen now, uh, seen none, we uh, do we, uh, we had a motion in a second. So can we do a roll call, please? Yes, Mayor Budowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Mayor Kennedy. <laughs> yes, I see you. Council Member Rice. Yes. Commissioner Welch. Aye. Commissioner Seal. Yes. Yeah. Mayor Bradbury. Aye. Commissioner Long. Yes. Commissioner Eggers. Aye, and that motion carries unanimously. Um, we're going to back up to 5A in just a second. Uh, and and Wit, just be thinking about, we have several other presentations here. From a time perspective, it's it's about quarter till four, and I don't want to lose a lot of people. So, um, as as the presenters are doing it, um, try to make it your shorter version. Um, and I, I I hate to to sell any of the presentation short. So, wait if you think if we get going too late, we may have to reschedule them or or shorten them a little bit today. So, I just want everybody to keep that in mind as they go forward. And I'm not doing that just ahead of Commissioner. Long's comments. So that wasn't directed at you, uh, Janet, I promise. Uh, just everybody else. Go ahead, Janet, talk to us about the PSTA. Well, thank you so much, um, Commissioner Eggers, and especially for your comments that you were not singling me out. I will be very brief. Uh, as you all know, we launched our brand new Sunrunner line uh, this last month, and we finally have received the grant agreement and the construction contract was let to the David Nelson construction company. And we're really happy about that. He has committed to make the whole project as the, as the least intrusive as he possibly could for the folks in um, South Pasadena and St. Pete Beach. And so hopefully we're going to be able to finalize the construction construction and get this done. It's the catalyst project for our 41 mile feasibility plan. As you know, we did have the groundbreaking ceremony on August 17th at Tropicana Field. Several of you were there. Thank you for that. 
We also, once again, PSTA is leading in the innovative technology space and will be demonstrating autonomous vehicles in downtown St. Pete starting in November and running through February, 2021. So again, we're looking forward to the future. The board approved an agreement with a company called Beep as the owner operator of the autonomous shuttles using Navia low speed vehicles to be deployed on Bayshore Boulevard connecting the Dali Museum to the Vinoy. We're also working on the expansion of the program to have demonstration projects in. Julie, you'll be happy to hear this. Dunedin and Clearwater, but we require further conversation with the cities and with FDOT to seek their financial partnership as well. Um, and lastly, the, we did, I think uh, Commissioner Albritton already spoke to the fact that PSTA did approve the, the uh, pedestrian crossing that we just took a vote on. And our next September board meeting will be on September 30th, by the way, at 6 p.m. And that's where we'll have our public hearing for our budget which will be finalized on September 16th, also at 6 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Janet, appreciate that uh, abbreviated mm -hmm. version. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Seal, T. Barda. Uh, yes, we had a virtual meeting on Friday, August 21st via Zoom. Uh, we approved a year extension on a contract to RSA Consulting for the state lobbying services and it is funded by local contributions. Um, we approved the $6.6 .6 million budget for TBARDA, um, which includes the commuter assistance program. Um, we approved resolution 2020-08, which is to support Maine County Area Transit Service Development grant application for improved service on Route 99. And then finally, we had a presentation on cable car um, technology by Stephen Dale of SCJ Alliance. And I think Wits is going to give a little bit more information on that. But it is, um, there, we lost quorum at that point. So in September 25th, 2020, on our Zoom meeting, we're expected to take uh, a vote on. Um, considering a resolution of support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Seal. Um, and we'll move into Tibarta Regional Rapid Transit Project presentation. Scott Pringle is here to give us a, uh, an overview. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Pringle with WSP. I'm the consultant project manager for the Regional Rapid Transit Project. Um, the RRT is, will be our region's first premium regional transit connection. It's 41 miles that connects Wesley Chapel all the way down to St. Pete along the I-275 corridor. Move to advance the slides. Um, to date, uh, we've accomplished two major milestones. You know, the first we started looking at uh, the prior recommendation coming from the planning phase, but really taking a hard look at some of the public comment that we got and how we can make refinements to that uh, proposal. And then moving into how we can, which alternatives can we develop and design to advance further into the project itself. So to date, we've been focused on five alternatives that was taken to the TBARTA board uh, June. We actually had several conversations with the board April, May, and June of this year. Um, our first alternative shown here is really just our baseline. This is looking at that 41 mile corridor and what we can do along that corridor without any major investments in um, the interstate or stations themselves or some low cost investments as stations along the corridor. This really gives us our point of comparison against the other uh, four alternatives, which as I mentioned, leaves us the four that were up for consideration in June. Uh, starting from left to right was the proposal on the left that came from the planning phase or the regional transit feasibility plan. Um, all the areas on the map that are in that dark purple are what we are uh, considering dedicated BRT lanes. So in Pinellas, you're looking at the opportunity coming out of St. Pete up into the gateway area, whereas uh, alternative two looked at express lanes across the Howard Franklin Bridge, picking back up and dedicated lanes as you move through Tampa up to the USF area, and then some mixed traffic as we headed towards Pasco. 
as I mentioned before, you know, we did receive uh, a lot of comments about the proposal from the planning phase. And some of those questions were, what about Pasco? What if we uh, had a dedicated BRT lane that connected up to Pasco County? So we included that, we evaluated that. Uh, we also looked at the opportunity to have a dedicated BRT lane across the Howard Franklin Bridge. And alternative five, the last of the five alternatives, put all those different pieces together to try to get as much dedicated BRT lanes as possible. So when I talk about a dedicated BRT lane, what I'm referring to is what I'm showing here on screen in Pinellas County. Um, what we're looking at is an outside running configuration for the BRT, where we're using the improved shoulders as part of the TB Next program. And again, uh, I wanna thank the Department of Transportation. They've been a great partner in this exercise. Um, and what we're looking to do is use those improved shoulders, create a 12 foot BRT lane, um, ideally with a four foot shoulder, both for drainage and disabled vehicles. Um, what, you know, as we look and evaluate what that outside running uh, lane would look like, a big part of the equation is how do we make sure that the operations run smoothly, efficiently, and safely, especially at the interchanges. So we work very closely with the Department of Transportation. We also work very closely with our executive team, which includes PSTA. And what we're looking at is, uh, you know, affectionately, I kind of refer to it as the highway version of the Sun Runner where as you get to an interchange, and I'll play this animation here, you'll see the, the vehicle move from a dedicated lane into that stripe version, where vehicles are allowed to merge into that auxiliary lane and exit the interstate at that interchange, whereas the transit vehicle continue to move through that section of the ramp back into a dedicated lane. So this really makes sure that we have the safety uh, of operations and efficiency of operations. It also gives us a lot of flexibility because we're having conversations now as to where the station should be. Um, and in the situation where we need to get off, we can easily get off at an interchange as well. So one thing I do wanna point out though, is a lot of times folks think of this corridor as the alignment would indicate, which is you know from St. Pete to Wesley Chapel, but you really can't think of it in, in terms of a route that starts in St. Pete, goes all the way to Wesley Chapel and turns back around. We're actually looking at multiple routes along that corridor. Um, these are just a couple examples here. Um, you know, and when we're talking about Pinellas County, we're looking at an option that's you know potentially focused on Pinellas County. But what we're finding is, you know, we see a lot of productivity out of uh, the routes that give you an express service from downtown St. Pete um, out through to the West area in downtown Tampa. So. We, in June, presented to the board a number of uh, technical modeling results of those five alternatives. Um, as you can see here, um, we're looking at daily riders of um, uh, passengers that would use the project. And this is in today's terms. So this is if the service were open today, who would use the project? Um, you can see when you work your way from left to right that alternative three, which is the piece where we filled in the Pasco gap, uh, got great ridership at between 63 to 70, uh, 6,700 riders a day, as well as alternative five. And again, alternative five was the alternative that has much dedicated BRT lanes as possible. Um, as a derivative of that ridership information, uh, we also have information on uh, annual reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Same pattern though, where you see alternative three and five really top out out of the group. And of course, we looked at greenhouse gas reductions. Again, same pattern, where alternative three and five were the top performers. Um, this is a, an early look at some of the potential costs related to the project, both, both from an alignment standpoint as well as operations. Um, and when you look at alternatives one, two, and three, we're actually at this point in time have our cost estimates are actually coming in less than what the prior planning phase was, which was about 455 million. Whereas when we add the conversation across the bridge, um, we're still working to determine exactly how we handle operations across the Howard Franklin Bridge. Um, but if we do need wi to widen that bridge, we're showing those costs here for that dedicated lane. And of course that puts us um, um, going the wrong direction where we're much higher in cost than we anticipated during the prior planning phase. We gave this uh, information to the TBARDA board um, at the June board meeting. The board did vote to advance alternatives one, three, and five. So that's our baseline. That's that connection to PASCO with dedicated BRT. And alternative five 
with the dedicated lane across the Howard Franklin Bridge. And again, you know, a lot of the focus on Alternative 5 is, you know, working with the department to understand exactly what's the best approach to get across uh, Old Tampa Bay. So that's where we've been focused up uh, and what we brought to the board in June. As we look forward to the project, uh, we're going to start looking at impacts. We're going to get into a lot more greater detail about the costs and then start talking about how this project could be phased and built over time. And a really big focus that we're heavily invested in right now is talking about stations. Um, and I want to make it very clear that the RRT is not taking a one size fits all to our stations approach. We recognize that there are a number of stations that should be designed to serve neighborhoods. We're on the other end of the spectrum. We have uh, stations that need to have parking associated with it. Like for example, in Pasco County where park and ride would be an excellent choice for folks to access the service. So we're working on that right now. We'll have some new information coming this fall um, about the different design approaches to those uh, station areas. And again, looking at everything from a variety of sort of premium system amenities, a choice of parking, everything from no parking to park and ride lots. So with that, Mr. Chair, I try to do that as quickly as possible and I'll take Thank you. Questions. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. I'm glad you were here to kind of update us on uh, what's going on. Um, so just if you don't mind, um, uh, I see there's a couple of questions. Uh, just real quickly, when you have a, a dedicated BRT lane and, and people that might be watching, uh, just thinking about a you know, dedicated car lane that, that uh, how do you compare? One's a mass transit, one's a car. Um, we're, we're, we're not encouraging people that have four people in the car to, to go on this lane. Obviously, this is just for transit, but talk a little bit about that, uh, the connectability of these. You know, as somebody mentioned on one of our last things, the connections are so important once you get there. That What do you do now? So as you, as you make your way through this, what kind of work are we doing? And are we looking at incrementalism here? Are we going to try parts of this? Or are we just like, are we just all in for the whole thing? Um, and without some of the details that, we, that I just asked about, just, just a couple of comments. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, the lane itself um, is basically looking to modernize our approach to the interstate system mm -hmm. and using the space that's already out there in terms of what we call uh, you know, multimodal activity. So you would have that lane, it would be dedicated for transit. Um, it's designed, as, as I mentioned, for the Regional Rapid Transit Project, but it absolutely has the opportunity for PSTA to use that same infrastructure. So we get this added, added value from that. It's not just the TBARTA project that's using the corridor. PSTA can use it. HART can use it. PCPT can use it. Um, you would, as an automobile user at certain locations, be able to cross this lane if you need to get to that shoulder. For example, a disabled vehicle, um, that is an opportunity there. But the lane itself uh, would be um, um, you know, held and reserved for transit use. Okay. Now, your question about uh, connectivity, uh, we do have 13 stations that we're looking at. Um, and keep in mind, this project is designed to serve folks getting back and forth to work, moving from Pinellas to Hillsboro, So those regional commuter style trips. So we have fewer stations. We've got 13 stations across the 41 mile corridor and that connectivity piece is absolutely critical. So we continue to work very closely with PSDA, identify where the best station locations are and make sure that there's great local transit connectivity uh, to that station. And to that end, we're, you know, we've been working with PSDA and looking at, you know, opportunities to maybe, you know, refine the PSDA service so that there is better connectivity. Uh, we have this great opportunity in downtown St. Petersburg, where the proposal as it stands now is to actually use the Sunrunner corridor. So we get obviously direct connectivity with the SunRail project, as Commissioner Long mentioned. Um, and then um, I forget your third point, Mr. Chair. Well, it was just it was just about the incremental piece versus yes, sorry, the phase all at once. Um, you know, um, kind of we by uh, uh, by default essentially have a, a, essentially a phasing plan already set forward uh, for this project because we need to be in lockstep with what the department's doing for TB Next and their phasing for the different segments of the 275 uh, modernization project. Okay. Thank we you, don't Scott. have we don't have a corridor without the oh. the DOT project. Thanks, Scott. Uh, uh, Councilmember Rice. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Scott. Hi. I, I think my question is similar. I just wanted to double down and try to understand the uh, dedicated BRT lane over the Howard Franklin Bridge a little bit more. And I'm looking at the Tampa Bay Next uh, website. So when we talk about a dedicated BRT lane, we're talking about lanes actually, because we would need one in each direction. Is, is that is that the thinking? Yeah, especially across the Howard Franklin Bridge, it's such a long span. You would definitely need two lanes, uh, just yeah, operationally from a transit perspective. So when we're looking at, so the department's preference, and wisely so, I mean, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense. They're putting a heck of a lot of money into uh, rebuilding and replacing the southbound span of the Howard Franklin Bridge. And right. within that, there's the tolled express lanes. And those mm -hmm. tolled express lanes by policy are to maintain at least 45 miles per hour or better um, mm -hmm. travel speeds, which from a transit perspective is amazing. You very, very rarely get that type of speed. So it's a great advantage to the transit project. Um, but we have had conversations from uh, a number of different stakeholders, business stakeholders, who kind of are concerned that, you know, what if the express lanes don't work over time? When we start looking 10, 20 years down in the future, what if there's congestion on those express lanes? So we have had that, that alternative five in the mix to look at what, if, what it would it take to create a completely dedicated lane for the BRT service rather than the, doing the express lanes. Unfortunately, the way it stands now for safety reasons and policy reasons, reasons at Tallahassee level, um, uh, we, we are not allowed to be in the shoulders next to the express lanes because you can imagine folks are, you know, paid a premium for that toll lane in the automobiles and they're moving. So we don't want that friction or conflict from a safety point of view. So in order to accommodate a dedicated BRT lane within the presence of those current express lanes, we have to actually widen the bridge. So that's where those big cost numbers come in for alternatives four and five. But I, I, my question is, there, there's just so much real estate dedicated to shoulders on both sides. Like there, ju there just looks like a lot of shoulder space, and I get it. We, we don't want our, we don't want our the BRT to come up on a disabled car and then have to switch lanes in an express lane. But, um, I mean, is there any wiggle room? Is there? any room that we could take on that left shoulder? Um, I will have to come back and give you an update because we are actively engaged in that conversation with FDOT right now. So I'm looking to a solution as we speak and I'll be able to speak to that more. Okay, well, I'm not an engineer, but um, <laughs> I, would, I would have to say that um, I, I share concerns about the conflicts between the express lanes and the BRT. Um, sharing the same lanes and um i would i would really be interested and supported to see what we can do to find dedicated brt lanes over the bridge but um thank you so much for your presentation i know you guys are working a lot at this so thank you is there anybody else i don't see any hand, hands raised anybody else have any questions okay scott thank you thank you uh, Commissioner Eggers, would you like to allow public comment on that item? Um, we, we, <coughs> with pleasure. We have we were is this a general discussion only or um, yeah, there's no um, no action required on this item. I didn't know if the board wanted to take send any action as desired, but we're not requiring it. It's just okay. an update. Um, uh, well, yeah, just yeah. See if there's anybody who wants to speak on it. Any members of the public who wish to speak on this, please use the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine. There are no members of the public wishing to speak on this. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to item 5D, which is our uh, Pinellas County Economic Development Update. Um, Mike, Mike uh, is here, Mike Mydell is here. Um, go ahead. Mike, you're on mute. Now, now I'm better, right? 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is a great opportunity to speak to you all, just to give you an update on where we are with the Penny for Pinellas and really the demands for office and industrial space, even in this COVID um, <coughs> we're dealing with, the pandemic area. So um, first of all, we've been looking at this for over 15 years. Back in 2004, we had the Pinellas by Design plan that already back then showed that we were running out of office and industrial space and that the, really the key to any economy is to create opportunities for high quality jobs that not only provide better um, uh, quality of life for the citizens, but bring new money into the local economy through sales of the products and services of these companies outside of Florida. And that brings new money in and gets paid out to the employees and they go out and buy things in the local community. And it just increases the volume of money in that local economy. And that's ultimately our goal with economic development. Now with the uh, referendum in 2017, we were given um, an opportunity to provide some incentives to developers for creating this office and industrial space. Uh, these studies over the last 15 years have shown that we are rapidly dwindling in the amount of, of acreage that's available for creating quality jobs for office and industrial uses. And those uh, demands on that space have only grown over time, uh, particularly as public storage has moved in in a big way and is using up a lot of that industrial space. And now with the opportunity for multifamily housing to take up industrial space, the pressure is on and we're seeing um, the opportunity for us to maintain our level of, um, in our quality of life here is, is uh, seriously in jeopardy. Uh, because as, as people uh, move out to surrounding areas for, uh, for their housing needs in Pasco and, and Manatee County, um, ultimately, there's a chance that the businesses themselves will move out there to cut the commuting time of their employees. So it's hand in hand, the job creation space and the workforce housing space. And fortunately, with, uh, with <coughs> Uh, Penella, uh, Penny for Pinellas 4, we have 165 million, probably a little bit less now with the COVID impacts, but, um, but still a significant amount of money over the next 10 years. And 4.15% of the total penny will go toward economic development capital projects, and 4.15% will go toward uh, affordable housing and workforce housing projects. And uh, we've already uh, put out the first uh, notice of funding availability and received applications for the, um, the housing component of this. And we are looking at that this Friday at the applications that have been received, um, over $40 million worth of projects and um, 18 different uh, proposals were received for that. So we're excited. The, uh, the market is definitely uh, looking for the opportunity to create those affordable housing opportunities for our citizens. And that goes hand in hand with, uh, with the workforce we need, the ability to attract quality workers to the area, the ability to keep those uh, workers here in Pinellas rather than having them go to surrounding counties to find uh, the, uh, the housing that they're looking for. And that also helps in the, uh, the issues we've been hearing with transit. Uh, if we can increase the density and, the, and keep our workforce here, we have a better opportunity to create the ridership we need for the BRTs and, uh, and to provide those uh, transit corridors that will connect the jobs to the housing and uh, get people back and forth to work without having to have two cars for a family. So we're excited about that. We're also excited that in December, we plan to launch the notice of funding availability for the economic development portion of it. And uh, again, uh, we're in the process now of putting those applications together. We'll put that out on the street. We're excited to announce that we have a new staff person that will be dedicated toward um, this penny for money for economic development. Teresa Bryden, of, uh, uh, formerly of Largo, has just joined our team. Uh, and along with Cindy Margiata, we'll uh, be working to identify sites to uh, work with our developers to get the word out that this money is available and to, to make sure that we connect with the people who want to create that office and industrial space. And then finally, in the interest of time, just want to cut to the, the general COVID impacts that we're seeing. 
Um, our industrial space is still about a 3% vacancy rate. It's very much in demand. Uh, a lot of our local companies are wanting to grow. We still have a lot of interest in, in businesses coming to this area. And, um, and we've got three or four developers already that are looking for sites to put up 100,000 square foot buildings. So the demand is still there very heavily on the industrial side, even with COVID. On the office side, we're seeing obviously less demand, um, primarily because a lot of office users are working from home right now. But in the long haul, the uh, real estate community believes that we'll probably have about a net square footage uh, demand level uh, in the long haul after COVID uh, because people are going to be wanting more space per person and likely will have fewer people in an office but the net square footage demand for office space is expected to be about the same. More people will be working from home, but there'll be opportunities for people to do office sharing and hoteling type operations and, uh, and to obviously meet as, as groups and do uh, synergies as a team as, uh, within the workplace. So we'd have more conference space and, uh, and more larger conference space so you can maintain social distancing. So we expect that the demand will stay about the same uh, once we recover from the, the current um, uh, lack of demand on office space. And then multifamily is still very strong. We have a lot of projects. Uh, you can look around the county now and see that uh, a lot of people wanna move here. We've got a great quality of life and uh, it's still very much in demand. With that, I, I wanna turn it over to you all. I know it's, uh, it's been a long day for you, but if you have any questions I can answer, um, I'll leave that up to you, um, but thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, Council Member Rice, you had a comment? Yeah, I'll be brief because I know we're running behind. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Mike. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the warehouse, the warehouse arts district in St. Petersburg, and I hope that we can be more flexible and more creative about um, the evolving uh, economics there built around art studios. Um, the railroad that goes to this area was converted to trails uh, a long time ago. And industrial jobs are just not going into this area. Perhaps we could be more flexible looking at different uses that could uh, include tech jobs or design or artist studios. So and we're starting to see a very successful model evolve in that area. And the arts are a big part of economic development for the city of St. Pete, as well as Pinellas County. So I, I hope that as this uh, evolves, that we'll see um, a more flexible attitude mm -hmm. about what we do in some of these uh, smaller areas near downtown St. Pete. Thank you. Oh, I agree. I think we'll see overall a lot of mixed use throughout the county because demands have changed and manufacturing today is not smokestack railroad, you know, uh, chain link fencing manufacturing anymore. It's buildings that look very much like office buildings and are very compatible with those uses that you, as you're talking about. So I think we could see a, easily see a mix of uh, the wonderful industrial um, clients we already have in, in that area with the uh, seafood packing and the uh, bakery, commercial bakery there, but also bring in the tech and bring in potentially office jobs and housing and, and make it all work as a, as a neighborhood, as, a, as an employment neighborhood. And I, I think there's some real opportunity there and throughout the county. <laughs> Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Mike, um, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation um, and tell you that I look forward to working with you on the Coca-Cola property. Yes. Um, as, or was, as we continue to go down that road, I did um, ask Bob for an update. Could you just repeat the dollar amounts that you told me you have put aside? Or you yes, told us um, that you put aside Right. There, over the 10-year period, there should be, even with the COVID reduction, about $80 million for economic development projects and about $80 million for housing, for workforce housing, uh, affordable housing for land only. For vertical construction, it would have to be in the 80 to 120% AMI range. But um, yeah, $80 million for each, $8 million a year, roughly. Okay. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention... Um, was the the affordable housing piece, which of course I'm I'm really excited about. I know we already uh, um, 
have a project in mind that's that's just off of 580. Um, and I know what some of the criteria is close to, to transit and all of that. Um, but I, I would also ask for flexibility because as you, on the transit piece, because as you know, uh, many of us have been working really hard to expand public transit everywhere. And there are a lot of small cities that just don't have, have that, but still have the need for affordable housing. So um, I would hope that that wouldn't be a make or break. So I, you don't have to answer it. I just wanted to throw that out there, keep that in mind and uh, you know, thank you. And thank you to the County Commission that is on this call today um, for putting that money aside. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good input. Any other comments? I can't see any. So um, Great. with that, thank you, Mike, for being here. Appreciate the, uh, the update. We'll, uh, we'll a lot going on in, uh, uh, in, the, in the months and year, a couple of years ahead. So thank you. Appreciate thank that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Chelsea, annual call for projects. <clears throat> are, you, are you there? Mr. Chairman, if you would like, we could skip this one. Okay. Uh, and I, or I could just briefly introduce it. Chelsea's given my approval, or <laughs> given her approval. Okay. Uh, essentially, this is just to update you on the three call for projects that we have, the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is smaller bicycle pedestrian projects. That Those are due this month. We have the Complete Streets uh, grant application. Um, part of that's for planning. Part of that would also be putting that into the five-year work program for construction. That's due, I believe, in October. And then we have the multimodal transportation priorities list. First time we're opening that up for a call for projects. Those are due in December. And we will bring this back to you uh, in March for approval. Uh, we will brief you uh, once we get all the applications in and let you know who submitted and what the projects are. Um, so that's really all I needed to say about that and just to keep okay. things moving unless anybody has any questions. Anybody have any questions for Wit on that? Okay, let's go ahead, uh, Whit, talk a little bit about the Legislative Committee appointment. Okay, now I have a 30 minute presentation for you. No, <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> um, we, we've had a Legislative Committee for several years. Uh, today, we are asking for interest in serving on that committee. Uh, there's no carryover from year to year. The committee generally runs from about October until um, after the legislative session, which I, I believe this year will be May or June. Uh, the session starts in March. Uh, and uh, what I have in your packet is background on the committee, back on, background on our priorities from last year, and then a copy of a presentation that I will not give today, but that I am going around uh, the county and giving to local governments, essentially just saying, you know, here are the issues that we are watching. Uh, here's what we think will uh, maybe be things to consider in 2021. And, um, and to be careful about uh, going to your legislators for earmarks, because ultimately that comes out of our transportation trust fund, if it's a transportation project and um, affects the priorities that we've established in working with the department. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair, to see who's interested. Um, I will report that uh, Council Member Gabbard, who's not here on the call today, uh, did send me an email expressing interest in continuing to serve on that committee. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so any, so you said, um, who, who's on there? I'm sorry, Whit. Uh, who, who's on there now? You're on there. Um, uh, council member Alt Britain, um, council member Gabbard and mayor Kennedy. Okay. Okay. So, so if there's anybody else that has interest in being on here, that, you know, speak up, those are, are the four that mentioned there. I'm the, I'm the chairman right now of the MPO. So I'm our four Pinnell. So I'm on there by definition, but um, whoever the incoming chair will be, will, will take my place on that committee. I, I'll correct that. I'm not sure you're on there by definition. I okay. think we, we thought it was a good idea. Uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> When we started this committee, uh, John Maroney was our chair and he wanted to be the chair of that legislative committee. But I got you. Sarah, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's in our bylaws. You are okay. correct. Okay, well, um, I'm sure the next chairperson uh, might want to be on there as well. So I think it's a good place for a chairperson to be. 
uh, not that they have to chair that committee, but they, they certainly need to be on that, I think. But, and we uh, can make that decision after we vote for the chair yeah. in November as well. Yeah, that's fine. Any, anybody else other than those, uh, uh, those other three folks that were mentioned, uh, are those three folks still interested? I mean, Gap, Commissioner, Council Member Gabbert's not here, but uh, David, you're interested? Okay. Um, who else? Okay. Yeah. Cookie, you still interested? Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? I can't see all the hands if there's any being raised. So, um, so right now I'm seeing those three myself uh, at this point. So um, I guess we need a, uh, action on this. Wit. Yes, we do. We need a, we need a vote. Okay. Uh, so first of all, is there a motion for those four? So moved. Second. And um, this is for a committee appointment. Do we need do we need to ask for public input on this one? Um, yes. Okay. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak on this item, please raise your hand in Zoom or press star nine if you're on the phone. There are no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, then we'll do a roll call on this, please. Mayor Bajowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Council Member Rice. Yes. Commissioner Welch. Commissioner Seal. Yeah. Mayor Bradbury. Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Eggers? Aye, and that motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you. All right, let's quickly move into director's reports. Whit? I'll keep this brief. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about US-19 this year, and um, so we are planning a US-19 corridor workshop uh, with the board in early 2021. I've been working with FDFT on the timing of this, and uh, we think that we'll have enough information ready uh, so that we can have that workshop in either late January or early February. Uh, that'll also provide input into the development of our priorities uh, for the coming year. Um, we will plan um, a complimentary public engagement uh, and outreach uh, plan that will probably happen after that workshop, uh, just in the interest of timing and getting some board direction and guidance on, on these things. So this will cover uh, the innovative intersection, uh, alternative concepts that were presented uh, back in February, um, time permitting and readiness permitting. We would also like to look at those frontage roads that I mentioned earlier and the study recommendations coming from that project as well. We may also have some additional news to present on the Gandhi US-19 interchange and potentially South 34th Street, but I, you know, we don't have an agenda yet. Uh, but I will be working closely with the department to ready an agenda and we'll we'll meet with the executive committee in December to finalize the agenda. Yeah. The uh, next item, unless there are any questions about that, uh, is the cable transit update that Commissioner Seal mentioned in her t -Barter report. And uh, based on the direction from the t -Barter board, I had a meeting with uh, David Green and another of his staff members to talk about what next steps might look like. And what we are envisioning uh, is, um, first of all, a, um, a series of one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with some key stakeholders to just affirm their continued interest, particularly the city of Clearwater. Uh, I've already heard from the city of St. Pete that they're interested in this uh, technology. Um, so we'll probably continue to meet with them. I think the chambers of commerce in both St. Pete and in uh, Clearwater, Amplify Clearwater, we'd like to consult with. And then um, I have already developed a scope outline for this work um, a, almost a year and a half ago with the consultant who made the presentation to Tibarda. And we have a cost estimate and we have a scope. Um, so I will sit down with them once I understand the interest um, of the local governments. And then we'll try to come to an agreement uh, by the end of the year on what a scope might look like. Um, and the idea would be that we'd be ready to begin in January. Uh, T-BARDA does have about $700,000 left in an innovative transit earmark that they were granted last year by the legislature. 
Um, I don't know that we'll need all of that $700,000, but um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are, um, um, there are permitting issues uh, that we'll have to deal with at the federal government level. And I don't think we necessarily need to tackle those first off with this study. I think we really need to look at more of a operating plan, capital plan, how we might fund it, what are some uh, public-private partnership options to consider, um, what kind of impacts would it have on travel time, on accessibility and connectivity to other modes. Um, but then we would certainly need to flag those uh, permitting and federal issues dealing particularly with the intercoastal waterway. And so we're probably gonna do some due diligence up front in this initial scope to at least vet those not go into a deep dive, but highlight any red flags that could be a concern. So I'll bring back a scope to you. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that TBARTA has the money and they will manage it, but the board directed us to work together. So it could be a joint project. Okay, any, any questions for Wit on either one of those? I'm not trying to brush things off at all. I apologize that we're moving, we're moving a little quick now, but um, and then um, you, everybody sees the informational items. I always like to draw attention to the fatalities map. We are down the August 31st this year over last year, down to 65, 74 last year. Um, I'm sure some of that has to do with us being uh, at home back in February, March, or March and April timeframe. But nonetheless, it's always a good thing when uh, fatalities are down. Some really always interesting Pinellas Trail data information. There's a couple of committee vacancies, one for the BPAC, for St. Petersburg and then the three for the local coordinating board. And then you can see the upcoming events. I was gonna give Wit just a minute to say something about the virtual bike city uh, tour, or uh, uh, bike your city and safety harbor. But I just wanted to again, remind everybody next month, we're gonna be forming a nominating committee. So please, if you're interested in being on there for the selection of our executive team, which will be, we'll choose in November, we're not having a December uh, board meeting. We approved that earlier. So in, in November, we'll, we'll make the selection. Is that right, Whit? Yes. Okay. So if you're interested in being on the nominating committee, that would be great. Think about that. We will need it probably three people um, and then go to work on trying to come up with a, a team for, the, for, for next year. Um, and I know there's just a lot of changes and movements going on as we look forward to next year, but uh, please give that some thought. It's really an important position. Whit, did you want to close with anything on the, uh, the bike tour? Or you... Yeah, in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to handle this. I was going to have Angela join us, but um, she's really been doing a lot of great work and hard work with other members of our team to plan what was going to be an in-person bike ride. We had over 100 registrants. Uh, this is going to be a virtual bike ride with social distancing. Registration is now open for the Bike Your City event. Uh, it'll be in Safety Harbor and a portion of Clearwater, October 16th through the 31st. And you can do it at your leisure on your own time. Uh, what we've done is we've built in a virtual scavenger hunt that's built around certain um, transportation and, and development planning themes. And basically you take your picture and uh, accumulate your um, scavenger items and uh, you can report that in. And uh, we track all that through um, an app and uh, it's gonna be a really cool event. And uh, I expect we'll have a lot of folks uh, interested in it. And we have um, t-shirts to give away to the first hundred or so registered. Thank you. And sorry, Angela, that we're we're it's a pass. I wish we could have heard from you on that, but we really need to kind of bring the meeting to an end. And just in, in closing, if there's anybody with any final comments or thoughts before we adjourn the meeting, please let me know. Anything that we may have missed, announcements or anything? Okay, well, thank you all for hanging in there for uh, three and a half hours. I really appreciate it. There's some good stuff that we had to get through today. The hearings were a little bit longer than I anticipated but uh, we got through them and I really, uh, again, thank you all for being here today and we are now adjourned. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.